correctional staff provide. Um, there's a public perception out there and has been for a long time about jails and, and jailers. Um, and it's not that. Jail is a place where people go um, when there's been a violation of the law or an alleged violation of the law until it's adjudicated. And it's incumbent on the folks who work in that jail to make sure that while they're there, they're safe and they're taken care of and they receive any treatment that they may need and any help that they may need. And when they're sentenced, when, when if and when they're found guilty or innocent, but when they're found guilty and they're placed in a, in a facility for a period of time to repay their debt to society, it's not just to repay their debt to society. It's so that they have a chance at rehabilitation and a chance at a change. <clears throat> That's one of the things that is, is not known or, or is, is not talked about as much in public is that the folks that you see in this room don't just keep us safe. They keep us safe, but that's not the only thing that they do. They work very hard at making sure that every opportunity is provided for people to get treatment for addiction, to get treatment for mental health disorders, to connect with a uh, homeless advocate on the outside so that when they re are released from custody, they have a place to go. They change the fabric of families in our county. They change direction of lives. And they change the fabric of our community. They do all of that in addition to keeping us safe every single day. They're literally part of the foundation that is law enforcement. Um, <clears throat> without them, the police have nowhere to go to book somebody. The courts have nowhere to turn to to keep somebody out of the public and keep us safe. They're part of the foundation of law enforcement. And to that end, uh, uh, this week is recognized as Correctional uh, Employees Week in the United States and in the state of California. I want to read the resolution now. Correctional officers have the difficult and often dangerous assignment of ensuring custody, safety, and well-being of over 1,800,000 inmates in our nation's prisons and jails, the highest incarceration rate in the world. Their position is essential to the day-to-day -day operations of those institutions. Without them, it would be impossible to achieve the foremost institutional goals, goals of security and control. In recent years, the service of officers has become increasingly complex and demanding, a growing and volatile uh, uh, inmate population. The important work a correctional officer does <clears throat> does not receive the recognition it deserves. It is appropriate that we honor the many contributions and accomplishments of these men and women who are a vital component of the corrections industry. In recognition of the contributions of correctional officers to our nation, Congress, by Senate Joint Resolution, has designated May 7th through the 13th as National Correctional Officers Week. It is appropriate that we honor correctional officers in all our institutions at all levels of government for their invaluable contributions to caring for incarcerated individuals in their custody. A correctional officer's job is difficult, stressful, and offers the reward that comes with maintaining order and offering protection while encouraging inmates to develop skills and attitudes that permit them to lead productive lives after their release. We call upon all Americans to observe this week with appropriate activities and ceremonies National Correctional Officers and Correctional Employees Week is an ideal time to recognize and celebrate correctional professionals for their devotion, bravery, and ongoing commitment to being change that they would like to see in the world. Therefore, be it resolved that the Solano County Board of Supervisors recognizes the week of May 7th through the 13th as Correctional Officers and Correctional Employees Appreciation Week. The board also commends the Correctional Officers and Employees of Solano County Correctional Facilities for their dedication and distinguished service to our citizens and the inmates of Solano County. Under Sheriff. Uh, good, <clears throat> good morning, board. Uh, good morning, board. Brad DeWall, Under Sheriff. So uh, thank you for giving us this opportunity and recognizing our staff today. I just want to kind of highlight this. This year is our 51st, uh, 51st anniversary of a correctional officer that we established it here in Solano County. So in 19, prior to 1972, which is the uh, milestone of what, which correctional officers were created here in the county, 
Uh, we had the jail across the street that was built in 1907. And uh, in 1907, we had deputy sheriffs that, that uh, ran the jail. Um, I think early, in those early years, deputy sheriffs literally would just stop through on patrol and check on inmates. It was kind of that very loose uh, check system um, until you know, closer to 1972 when we started to get more population in the jails and we had more issues. There wasn't enough deputies or time to do those checks, which caused uh, our sheriff back then, Sheriff Cardoza, to, uh, and the board to establish the, the uh, classification of correctional officer. Uh, back then, they, they hired three correctional officers to run the jail back then. Uh, the undersheriff and his wife lived above the, uh, the jail, and the wife actually cooked the meals for the inmates at that time. So uh, it just kind of shows you the, I guess, the simplicity of the times of how things were. And so from three correctional officers to now close to 300 with three jails and a vocation training center, we've just come a long way and things have changed a lot. Back then we had, uh, you know, mostly just keys and, and uh, you know, radios. Uh, now our folks are carrying PDAs um, to access and turn off water and turn on electronics and access record information. Um, it's a very uh, technical skill set, a very uh, much the profession that it has become to be. Um, it's, I guess as things has continued to evolve, uh, to highlight a few things, you know, and I brought up here, but who doesn't love a dog, but this is uh, a Wally, and uh, Officer McDowell that handles Wally. So Wally runs around our jail. Uh, he does narcotics. He also does electronics because that's the thing. <clears throat> Who knew, right? <laughs> but uh, but I, I would also add that it's also just like any other animal around. It's a, it's a bit of a comfort tool, right? So, I mean, it's a stressful job. And we can constantly strive to do more things for our staff to take care of them and making sure because of that stress and because of the things they have to deal with that they have that, that there. I, uh, I would uh, say that it's become a very challenging and technical job. It's something that you couldn't imagine at this point that uh, on their belts, they also have to carry Narcan because we have a fentanyl crisis in this country. And the fact that they have to do that is, is, is just, well, who would imagine that that's where we're at? But it's just a big, uh, uh, something that we're dealing with this and something that they have to deal with on a daily basis and the stresses that they deal with. So with that, I would just like to uh, thank the board for recognizing our correctional officers. Correctional officers, I'd like to thank uh, each and every one of you for everything you do for us. Thank you. Thank you, Under Sheriff. Now, I'd like to invite all the staff down here uh, uh, for a group group picture um, with this resolution. If you come down in front of the board here, please. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I got to ask him. I can't tell him no more. I got to ask. No. Under Sheriff, did I see Keith Bloomfield in the room earlier? Or did he run off? Oh. Oh, all right. It was worth a shot. I had one C1 in the room. I wanted to get him. Yeah, you know. Uh oh. Close quarters. <laughs> yeah, I got a dip right there.
Thank you, Mitch. Thank you. Madam Clerk, item two. Adopt and present a resolution recognizing May 12th, 2023 as Child Care Provider Appreciation Day in Solano County. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. second. Moved and second. Please vote. So ordered by a 5 0 vote. Right. Good morning, everybody. One of my favorite topics, child care, children in general. Um, and today it is an honor, thank you, Chair, for this honor to present this resolution of the Solano County Board of Supervisors proclaiming May 12th, 2023 as Child Care Provider Appreciation Day in Solano County. And I can tell you one of the greatest challenges of new parents who are trying to get back to work is finding quality child care. And in our county, it is probably one of the hardest places to do that work, um, which is why First Five Solano Commission uh, Children and Families Commission is putting forward an, er an early learning center to increase the number of child care slots. Um, well, we'll hear more about it later, I'm sure. <laughs> All right. Whereas high quality child care and early education play a crucial role in child development, health and nutrition, child abuse prevention, and social emotional outcomes that result in enhanced school readiness and successful K through 12 educational and higher education experiences. One of the things quality child care does is keep you out of the jails that we just heard a lot about. So whereas child care providers include teachers and caregivers in child care centers, family child care homes, and extended family, friends, and neighbors, all of whom are essential to supporting working parents. There are over 500 licensed child care providers, over 780 licensed exempt child care providers, and countless other community members in Solano County who provide this essential service which supports the local economy. Child care programs, which are mostly small businesses run and staffed predominant, predominantly by women, are still recovering from health and financial hardships stemming from the pandemic while they have continued to meet the needs of families. Solano County acknowledges the crucial role that child care plays in the local economy, resource infrastructure during emergencies, and in everyday lives of community members who count on safe and reliable child care to work, go to school, and become self-sufficient. And the Solano Family and Children's Services, in partnership with other early childhood community partners, continues to engage in a child care provider recruitment campaign with the goal of expanding the availability of licensed child care settings to serve families in, in Solano County, to aid in the recovery stage of the pandemic, and to support growth in the years to come. Solano Family and Children's Services, the First Five Solano Children and Families Commission, the Local Child Care Planning Council, along with advocacy organizations across the United States, will be increasing awareness of the importance of child care providers on May 12, 2023. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Solano County Board of Supervisors does here broke by proclaim May 12th. It should be all of May again, I'm, but you know, we'll take a day, I guess, maybe next year a week, as Child Care Provider Appreciation Day in Solano County, signed by our chair, uh, John Vasquez. And so who is first? Oh, good, Lorraine. <laughs> good morning, supervisors, public, and uh, staff. I'm Lorraine Fernandez. I'm with First Five Solano, and I'm happy to be here today with Ms. Kathy Lago, who is the Executive Director of Solano Family Children's Services, and Ms. Melba Jean Nears, who has been a child care uh, provider. <clears throat> I shouldn't just say child care, we're really missing a piece. Child care and early learning provider in our community for many years, so you'll be hearing from them. And we're here to present the resolution proclaiming May 12th, 2023, as Child Care Provider Appreciation Day in Solano County. So this day is a time to recognize the importance of child care providers and the vital role that they play in supporting our working parents, providing high quality early learning and care, and making sure that children have the best chance to succeed in school and in life. So with that, I would like to introduce Ms. Kathy Lago, and she is going to have a few comments. Thank you. 
Thank you, Supervisor Hannigan. You are um, a supporter of us always, and we appreciate it. The board has always supported early childhood and child care providers in our community, and I appreciate the time today. You're right, it should be a full month. <laughs> Every day is Child Care Provider Appreciation Day. So in this last couple of years due to COVID, we've had unprecedented funding. We have served more families on our child care subsidy waiting list than ever before. We could never have dreamed it. We've served families, emptied that waiting list, and filled it and emptied it again. But that's only half of the story, right? Without the child care providers, the professionals, the people in our community who take that time to nurture young children, we cannot do this. And, and the money that we get to serve those families will not go anywhere because we need to have both parts of that story. We really appreciate the board because you also supported us with ARPA funding. We're working with the Workforce Development Board, working on child care provider recruitment and training, helping them with good business um, uh, acumen so that they will be long lasting because children need consistent care, long term care. We don't want them moving from place to place when people can't keep their business running. Child care businesses are integral. It's our economy. Child care is one of your small businesses in this county. And we want to always continue to remind you of that. Our child care providers here have to do two things really well. They have to run a business really well, and they have to nurture children. And that's quite a, a unique role. It's not always simple. So we're there to help them and support them. The board, Workforce Development Board, all of our partners need to do that. We're having a special day on uh, May 20th, a Saturday. We invite you to come by to our office in Fairfield because we're taking a little bit of time to pamper our child care providers and let them know how special they are and important in the lives of children. And now I have the honor of introducing two local child care provider professionals who not only work in the field, but they employ people in our community. And so I have Melba Jean Nears, the director of We Are Family Child Care Center, as well as P3 Academy, and Gloria Onoma, who manages Jada Learning Center Family Child Care Home. And so first, Melba Jean. Hello. My name is Melba Jean Nears, and 34 years ago, in June of 1989, um, I, after four years serving in the Air Force and 12 years serving in the crew um, outside at PG&E, I decided that I wanted to become a child care provider and be home with my children. Um, I didn't know much about the child care business, so I found out that Solano Family Children's Services was the place to contact. I contacted them and they um, let me know how to get started in being, becoming a child care provider as a small family child care. So I opened that in my home and then um, three months later, after being in contact with other providers, I, um, my enrollment increased and so I enlarged to a large family child care. In my home, my husband, who was a correctional officer, came home and decided he had too many children in the house because he only wanted two. And so we found in 1995, we located a building, a child care center, and we purchased that property, which we still own. Um, we also now operate um, P3 Academy, which is near Travis Air Force Base. Over the years, I have found that child care has changed. The face of child care has changed. Families have changed. They are no longer just two parents and children. There are sometimes grandparents. There are sometimes aunties. There are sometimes cousins that are caring for the children. Also, the hours of work for parents have changed. With that, we have had to change as providers. Our hours of operation have changed, our days of operations have changed in order to meet the needs of the families in the community. Um, with that, sometimes we can work extra hours, we can feel unappreciated, we can feel un overworked, and so this um, proclamation, we really thank you for recognizing us as providers and the work that we do. Um, because we do it with our hearts and we want to continue to do it. Um, so both for the long-term people like me and for the newcomers of providers, we thank you and we encourage you to continue to support providers and um, know that the hands and the hearts of the providers who assist not only the children but the parents in being better parents um, and we're raising children who will one day be our future doctors, our lawyers, our mechanics, and our council members. 
So we thank you for this proclamation. Good morning to the board. Um, thank you to the Board of Supervisors for affording me the opportunity to speak about my program and commitment to quality. Thank you, Pastor Bell, for passing the baton. There is a popular African proverb that says, it takes a village to raise a child. That means that an entire community of people must provide for and interact positively with children for those children to experience and grow in a safe and healthy environment. This is so true of the solid ECE community that we have in Solano County. I would like to acknowledge Solano Family and Children's Services, Quality Counts, First Five, Child Start, just to mention a few. All these organizations have amazing programs that are centered just around the family. I am very passionate about quality childcare and believe that the biggest impact in a person's life would be in the childhood. I can confidently say that for the three years that our doors have been open and our hearts have been open, we have met and are continuing to meet the, the needs of the families that we serve. I'd like to share a story with you. Last summer, I had a family who was enrolled in my program. This family was experiencing severe homelessness. And the six months or so that they were with me, they had moved over nine times. I'm talking hotels, motels, Airbnbs, relatives, just name it. However, this mother had just one goal. She wanted her child to be in school every day. And so what that would look like would be taking a bus, a one hour bus ride to the transit center and walking two miles to and fro the transit center just to make it to daycare. This little girl was just two years old. In the summer, if you remember, it was really hot last summer. And her mom was this tall, she was this little, she would walk beside her mom with good faith just to make it to school. Some days, I'll get a text from her, she'll go, Miss Glory, I'm not sure I can make it to school five days this week because my bus pass is almost out. I can only make it two days, the two days that I have a job interview. And so what I would then do would be, I'll reach out to the partners that I partner with, Charles, that all these great programs, and we would try to find her a bus pass. And so sometimes we'll get it immediately. Other times my coach and I would have to get creative. Uh, my coach would offer to give up her own bus pass or I would offer to pick the kids up and drop her back home. And so she, she um, fast forward to February this year, I had met mom at a party. She looked so good and I was truly happy for her. She gave me tight hugs and she said, Miss Glory, this is what I look like when I'm not in survival mode. So this goes to show that the system does work if we all play our parts. We would meet desired outcome. I share this story with you today just to say that it's important to make a wiggle room when we make policies and when we allocate fundings for things like bus passes and the likes. Because a mother shouldn't have to choose between getting her daughter to school and saving to go for a job interview. Lastly, I would like to appreciate the board for presenting the Child Care Providers Appreciation uh, Day Resolution. As you've all come to see, child care providers are essential workers. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Jamila Hanif. I've been a licensed family home child care provider for 10 years in Vallejo, California. Um, grateful for Kathy Lago um, and all the work that she's been putting in at Solano Family Children's Services, um, seeing the growing partnerships here in Solano County, um, just like Supervisor Ed, um, Hannigan stated about us having an early learning center in Vallejo, which will allow us to serve more families. And that all started with partnerships, partnerships with Child Start, First Five Solano, the Family Home Child Care Provider, Solano County Office of Education, and Head Start, Child Start, and Solano Family Children's Services, because that's what it takes, collaborations and partnerships. So I just want you guys, before you leave here, or when you leave here, keep this in mind. Imagine a day without child care. There's anybody who provides child care, whether you're a parent, a grandparent?
Thank you, Aaron. Madam Clerk, item three. Adopt and present a resolution recognizing May 2023 as Wildfire Awareness Month and May 6, 2023 as Community Wildfire Preparedness Day in Solano County. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. So moved and second. Please vote. So ordered by a vote of 5-0. I have a resolution of the Board of Supervisors today recognizing May 2023 as Wildfire Awareness Month and May 6, 2023 as well, a Wildfire Community Preparedness Day. Wildfires have become so common in California and also in, in Solano County. We have nearly 90,000 acres. It's considered very high to high to moderate risk of wildfires. And all of us know it's the western side of the county which touches every district from the first, the second, to the fourth, to the fifth. We all touch a part of the western side of the county. And we've realized since uh, 2017 with the Atlas Peak Fire and the LNU of 2020 that these fires are devastating. The Solano County lost over 300 homes in the LNU and nearly 1,000 structures. Uh, so it's, it's become so commonplace that you know, we probably expect it to happen every year. And this year's no different with all the rain and the high grasses and then the dead trees that, that have, have uh, accumulated over not just the fire but over the drought itself. And what we know is that nearly 90% of the fires are caused by human, human interaction. So we do have the ability to control if we understand what our responsibilities if, if we live out in the area and how we support the community and being prepared. Uh, again, on May 6th, out here in front, uh, we're going to have a community day um, showing people how to be uh, more, more resilient, take actions in being prepared for a wildfire. I'd like to thank um, my staff person, my aide, Jennifer Hamilton, for doing the work within, uh, with, with, in our office, and Nancy Nelson, um, one of our analysts who's done a great deal of work. And I'd like to thank Senator Dodd again for the $1.9 million that he gave us, a grant that was unrestricted that allowed us to buy um, radios that we could hand out. They're all on the same frequency. And that's important when you're out in, the ground, out in the field to be able to communicate back and forth and begin to help us resolve that issue of radio inoperability. But at least the men and women that are out fighting the fires can communicate with each other. So I'm going to turn it over to, to Nancy, I think. Thank you. Good morning, Chair, members of the board, Nancy Nelson, Senior Management Analyst with the County Administrator's Office. So on behalf of the Sheriff's Office, Office of Emergency Services, Resource Management, and the County Administrator's Office, I would like to thank you for this resolution in support of this very important day. So this is an annual event that happens nationwide, and this is the first time we're going to recognize the event in Solano County with an event this weekend, Saturday, May 6th. The event will be held at 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. here in the plaza outside the County Administrative Center at 675 Texas Street, Fairfield. The county is sponsoring this event to kick off wildfire preparedness season. This is a um, culture that we're trying to cultivate, and we're hoping this becomes an annual tradition throughout the county. We're hoping the community comes out to learn about wildfire preparedness and to learn what they can do to go back to their homes to reduce fuels and to harden their homes. So resources that'll be made available will be um, sign-ups for uh, developing programs such as a chipper program, a pilot program for signage, as well as our green waste bins that will be located throughout the county. And this will enable folks to go home, clean up their yards, and have a place to drop off those fuels. Hello. Um, so this event is all about collaboration, much like the previous uh, resolution. Um, a lot of great people have come together to make this day happen, to bring our state funds, our county funds, and all of our existing resources to focus on fire risk here in the county. Uh, this event is going to happen rain or shine, um, and 
We are really excited about it. There's going to be some fun stuff, some really informative things um, to get us going and prepared for fire season. We want to thank the board members again for this recognition of this important day to help us to raise some additional awareness about wildfire. Um, and we look forward to this being a tradition. And like my boss already said, we um, want to give a special thanks to Senator Dodd for these funds that are allowing us to develop a community wildfire protection plan and allow us to build a foundation to just be more resilient against wildfire when it comes around inevitably again. Um, and thank you to Cal Fire and to our community fire safe councils, which have done so much work on their own. We're trying to bolster them and provide them with resources to make them even stronger. Um, so this is exciting. This preparedness day is, is um, all of that coming together, and we're excited about it. And now we have... And you are. Oh, I am uh, Jennifer Hamilton, Supervisor Vasquez's aide. And now we have OES to talk about some important stuff. Thank you. <coughs> Good morning, Chair Vasquez and members of the board. Uh, I'm Christine Castillo. The sergeant at the sheriff's office and currently assigned to the Office of Emergency Services. Uh, we as first responders and emergency managers can write plans, we can continually exercise those plans, but it isn't until you have whole community buy-in that those plans will be successful. Uh, we all know the saying, as it was mentioned in the previous presentation, it takes a village. Uh, and it really does, not just with childcare, but with disaster preparedness. Whether you live in rural, unincorporated Solano County or in the city, we encourage everybody to join us this Saturday to meet your first responders in advance of the disaster. Get to know those community partners um, and learn what you can do to better prepare and reduce your risk of wildfire. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Let's stop, huh? that now we'll have items from the public. I do have two speaker cards right now. Are there any callers? Callers on the line, if you wish to speak under items from the public, please press star three to raise your hand. Callers on the line, if you wish to speak from on items from the public, please press star three to raise your hand. Sir, at this time, I have no one raising their hands. Okay, with that, uh, our first speaker is Doug Cars, count, uh, city councilman from the city of Fairfield. Moral support. Moral support. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good morning. Good morning, board. Um, I'm here today in hopes of a continuation of improvements in our city of Fairfield's downtown area, the heart of Fairfield. We are currently spending more than $20 million to re-energize the downtown area and would very much like to see the 701 Texas Street property be part of this uh, revitalization. The city understands environmental challenges with the property and that it takes time to get clearance. However, is there any possibility of painting the building? Um, the city has an art and public places program that could fund a mural um, on the Jefferson side of the building perhaps. Um, recently, we've issued a building permit for the dumpling house right across the street from in the former Starbucks building. That will soon get under construction, including adding outdoor dining. We simply ask that the county to prioritize cleaning up one of the worst looking buildings downtown, or at least let the city help with making the most ideal location in downtown look a lot better. 
Thank you very much for your time, and please let me or Scott Tonneson, this is his district, know who will be the point person on your team to begin working on this issue. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> The next speaker is George, George Gwynn. George? Good morning once again. Um, I say ditto to the previous uh, speaker or speakers. Um, that said, I sent you guys a video of Beverly Hills last night. It's about an hour and a half, which I, I'm sorry is a little long. Maybe you can break it down to 20 minutes a day till you get it. Um, watch, but you guys really need to, to see this uh, video because it goes through the whole town and you don't see uh, trash on the sidewalk, you don't see homeless people walking around. Everything looks like uh, America used to look back in the 50s. It, it looks pretty good. And um, I, I think it shows that the idea that um, Nothing can be done but to let the homeless get by with stuff they shouldn't be getting by with um, uh, can be managed and um, we can get back to, to doing regular business. Um, here's the deal. Um, the taxpayers, I'm sure, don't like to pay taxes, but um, they're pretty much forced to. You guys work for us, and you're supposed to spend the money to do things for the people that are paying the taxes, not for the people that are not paying the taxes, and homeless are getting all kinds of resources, uh, uh, housing, whatever, uh, food. Um, they don't have to pay for it if they don't have a job, and most of them don't have a job. So uh, the system is getting out of hand because you got the people paying um, taxes that aren't getting what they're supposed to get for services, and the money and the uh, resources are going to the homeless. And it's um, like uh, getting uh, sucked into a whirlwind that uh, just goes down, down, down. And um, it doesn't have to do that. So uh, if Beverly Hills, uh, Calabasas, and other cities can uh, do it, they don't have to end up like San Francisco or Los Angeles. And I'm sure you guys have seen those films, and it's not a very pretty picture. So I hope you'll look at the, the film and uh, come up with uh, some different solutions because the ones that are being used now are not going to work like they should. Thank you very much. Thank you, George. Uh, that's the last of my speaker cards. I'll ask one. Oh, got one more. Okay. Well, that was the last, again, is the last of my speaker cards. Yep, no for and no callers. We'll now move on to additions or deletions of the agenda. At, uh, no changes to the agenda. I do have a minor correction when we get to the consent calendar. Okay. With that, uh, a motion to approve the agenda? Second. Been moved and second. Please vote. So ordered by a vote of 5 0. And before I call on public comment on the consent, does any board member wish to comment or pull an item off of consent? I just have a um, clarifi clarification question for number 10. And that's it. You want to ask that now or? Okay. Uh, well, um, my question is just based on some of the wording uh, in the report that indicate that we're not required or it just indicates we just need to make sure we have this housing element um, in writing. But I just wanted to make sure, because, I, because in 2021 there was a new law that said if we, a failure to implement the program action could lead to litigation or something like that. So I just wanted clarity. Does this not take effect now or do we, or will it be take effect in a later date um, based on that new law? Uh, 
I'll speak to the, the legislation. The legislation was, um, provides for if a housing element is not certified by HCD and approved by this body by a certain time, then yes, the county would be subject to potential for litigation, which is called a builder's remedy. Um, our housing element, the, the new housing, the updated housing element has been submitted to HCD. I don't know the status of it. We have, we have gotten comments back from HCD, probably about a number of pages of comments, which is fairly typical for that process. And we're now responding to the various comments that they've made on our draft. Okay. All right. What do you say? <laughs> <laughs> All right. I just wanted clarity on that because when I read that, I'm, I'm like, wait a minute. I thought there was some other law. Okay. That was it. Thank you for the clarification. Yeah, we, we have seen pr pr proposed legislation over the last few years that would have more requirements for actually building housing, but it hasn't. Those have not actually been implemented at, or adopted by the legislature yet. Oh, okay. I know a bag. Uh, draft indicates the county may be responsible for 900 housing units. It's just a draft, <laughs> but I just was checking. All right, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Mr. Chairman, I just want to make that quick correction on the one item on the consent calendar, which is item number nine. Um, the, the agenda shows that the um, contract with Rincon, or it's an amendment to a contract with Rincon Consultants, which provides planning services. Uh, it mentions authorization of the director of resource management. If you look at the draft contract that's been signed by the uh, one of the principals from Rincon, it's actually uh, it references county administrator. So we just need to change that from director of Re resource management to county administrator. Which item was that again? I item number nine. Okay. Yes, I am. May I, may I, sorry, one moment, please. I can. Callers on the line, if they want to speak. Under oh, okay, I thought I did, but. Callers on the line, if you wish to speak under public comment for the consent calendar, please press star three to raise your hand. Callers on the line, if you wish to speak under public comment for the consent calendar, please press star three to raise your hand. Sorry, I have no one raising their hands. With that, we'll take the motion. Was there a second? I don't. It's been moved second. Please vote. This is on the consent. So ordered by a vote of five zero. calendar receive an update from staff on items discussed at the April 24th 2023 legislative committee meeting consider taking a position on AB 50 AB 400 AB 504 AB 595 AB 702 AB 817 AB 1672 and SB 706 Receive an update from the county's federal legislative advocates on the status of legislative issues of interest to the county and receive an update from the county's state legislative advocates on the status of legislation that is of interest to the county. Thank you. Good morning, board members. Matthew Davis with the county administrator's office. Joining us this morning with me is Karen Lang of Shaw Yoder, Antwi, Schmelzer, and Lang. And then on the phone, we also have our legislative advocates from Paragon Government Relations in Washington, D.C. So before we start for the uh, bills for board's consideration this morning, I'd like to ask that the federal and state legislative report outs go first, if that's okay with the board. Okay. Uh, Joe, Tom, Hassan, go ahead. Uh, good morning to the board members. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Yes, we can. Okay, excellent. Actually, good morning. Well, th this is Jill from Paragon. Uh, Tom and Hassan are on as well. Thanks for, for having us this morning. Uh, we'll be relatively brief in our comments, focusing a lot about a lot on fiscal issues um, this morning. Um, I'll start off just to give a quick overview on where things are with the fiscal year 2024 uh, budget and appropriations process. Uh, as the board members are aware, um, the uh, the budget process kicked off in, in, in February March timeframe with the release of President Biden's uh, FY 2024 budget. Since that time, there's been a series of budgetary hearings, cabinet officials, and agency department heads uh, going up to Capitol Hill. 
Uh, the appropriations bills uh, have not yet uh, been written, although uh, we do expect the House Appropriations Committee to begin marking up uh, the 12 annual appropriations bill sometime this month. Um, so that'll, that'll start um, officially now here in the next couple of weeks. Um, the one thing I did want to highlight on the appropriations process is Solano County's uh, earmark or community project funding request. Um, pleased to report and confirm that uh, all four of the county projects that were submitted to our congressional delegation are in play. Uh, they have all been uh, requested for funding. So we're talking about funding for the, the county's emergency operations and mission center project. Uh, funding for the uh, Vallejo uh, Early Learning Center um, project. Uh, there's funding that's been requested for the uh, Sacramento San Joaquin Delta One Water Initiative, which of course involves Solano County and the other uh, Delta counties uh, coalition members. And there's also been funding uh, requested for the county's uh, radio infrastructure and interoperability uh, improvements project. So um, again, in some way, shape or form, those have all been uh, requested by various members of the delegation. Uh, and we should we should know more information now as the appropriations committees begin to mark up. And um, again, we've been pushing to to make sure that, that funding is actually included in the FY 2024 um, budget. So um, I'm going to parlay this over and kick it over to Hassan, uh, who's going to talk a little bit about the uh, the debt ceiling legislation that the the House approved um, uh, last week. And there's a tie-in directly, of course, to the FY 2024 budget and appropriations process. Uh, because the uh, the House passed bill actually would seek to cut funding back for the uh, for the FY 2024 um, budget cycle. So Hassan, if you can can walk us through that. Sure, thanks, Joe. Um, sure, you've all probably been hearing a lot about the debt limit lately. Uh, the debate really kicked off back in January when the Treasury Department announced that they would have to start using what they call uh, extraordinary measures to avoid defaulting on the nation's debt. Since that time, we've sort of been at a standstill with neither party willing to budge off their position. So on the one hand, uh, we have the Biden administration and Democrats in Congress who have consistently been calling for a clean debt limit extension with no strings attached. On the other side, uh, House Republicans have been adamant about the need for some significant spending cuts and concessions as part of any deal. Again, there's been very little progress since January. Uh, at least part of that was driven by the fact that there wasn't a whole lot of clarity around how long Treasury could stay under the existing cap. The, the estimates about when the deadline or what you may hear referred to as the X date um, and when that would hit were all over the place. There just wasn't a lot of urgency or motivation to get something done quickly. So that all may have changed uh, as we got a little bit more clarification on that potential X date this week. Treasury Secretary Yellen just warned congressional leaders that the, the federal government would be unable to, to pay or satisfy all of its uh, debt obligations by as early as June 1st. That's actually not too far off from what analysts were predicting we'd hit the limit, but um, it is on the earlier end of that, that timeline that we were expecting. By the way, that June 1st date is a worst case scenario. The, the actual default date could come weeks later, but for now that's, that's the date that matters. Uh, so we're less than a month out from that deadline. Time is running short. Um, that's most likely what prompted President Biden to invite uh, House and Senate leaders from both parties for a meeting at the White House next week. That meeting is set to take place on May 9th, so one week from today. Going into that meeting, Republicans may have a bit of the upper hand in negotiations. You may have seen that the House was able to pass a bill last week, um, which at this moment is the only show in town. Uh, it's called the Limit Save Grow Act. So if you hear that title, you know that they're talking about the, the House Republican debt limit proposal. It's a lengthy bill. There's a lot in there. I won't go into too many details. I'll just touch on a, a few uh, key highlights. So the main piece of the bill is that it would suspend the debt limit through March 31st of next year or until the debt increases by $1.5 trillion, whichever happens first. It would also freeze discretionary spending at fiscal year 2022 levels. So just to clarify, those are last year's funding levels we're talking about. That would be a cut of about $130 billion, and those cuts would be targeted uh, largely at domestic discretionary programs. The other big piece of this uh, that I wanted to mention is that it would limit the growth of spending to 1% each year over the next uh, 10 years. Um, so those are the main provisions that address the debt limit uh, that seek to limit future spending. Uh, there are a few other things in there as well. Uh, there's a section that would rescind or claw back any unobligated COVID-19 relief funding. Now that applies to the CARES Act, 
the American Rescue Plan Act. There's a few other bills that are approved over the last uh, few years that would fall under this uh, rescission language. Um, it also targets a number of programs and clean energy tax credits that are included as part of the Inflation Reduction Act. That's that uh, the climate package that got over the finish line at the end of last year. Um, there's some Republican energy permitting reforms that are approved by the House earlier this year. I will say that a few of those provisions do have some level of bipartisan support, so that might be an area where they can find common ground. Um, I do want to turn it over to Tom here in a minute to talk about some of the health and human services reforms that are included. But before I do that, I'll just mention that this bill is dead on arrival in the Senate. Uh, Democrats control the chamber, and Majority Leader Chuck Schumer has made very clear that he would not bring this package to the floor. Uh, even if it did come up for consideration, it would need 60 votes to pass. Uh, saying that it would really only be brought up to show that it doesn't have the support to pass the chamber. Um, so that's something we'll be monitoring. Um, again, while, while this bill won't advance any further along in the legislative process, at least that's not what we're expecting, what it does do, and I touched on this earlier, is put additional political pressure on President Biden and um, congressional Democrats to negotiate. Uh, and with that, I will now turn it over to Tom to provide a few additional details. Thanks, Masan, and, and good morning, board. Uh, just a couple of items of note in that deficit reduction package that uh, Hassan described that relate to health and human services programs. Again, the bill is not expected to move into the Senate for consideration, but a couple of the items I'm about to describe will indeed, I believe, come up uh, in future pieces of legislation. First of all, with respect to SNAP or CalFresh, um, the bill, uh, the deficit reduction bill would require or increase uh, the age for work requirements for single individuals from ages, from the current age of 49 to, to 55, um, and it would decrease the flexibility states have to get waivers to serve uh, in single individuals in the areas of high unemployment. Um, Congressional Budget Office estimates that about 275,000 individuals uh, across the country each month would lose uh, SNAP benefits under that proposal. Perhaps a, a more sweeping proposal, although is the, the Medicaid work requirement proposal. Again, uh, focusing on single individuals, this would be the first federal um, work requirement for persons receiving health care. Um, single individuals between the ages of 18 and 55 would have to either work 80 hours uh, a, um, a month or work and provide community service for 80 uh, hours a month. CBO estimate, estimates that about 1.5 million individuals would lose coverage. Um, these individuals would come primarily from states that adopted the Affordable Care Act Medicaid expansions. Um, and HHS um, estimates that within California, and specifically they have a county by county breakout that about 38,000 Solano County individuals would be subject to these work requirements if that legislation was indeed enacted. And then finally, and then I can, I'll turn it over to the board for any questions. Uh, with respect to the farm bill, we did uh, uh, deliver up to uh, the congressional uh, offices, uh, Solano County's uh, Farm Bill white paper. Um, the bill itself at this point is still uh, in the hearing mode, um, both within the House and the Senate. We have not seen any legislative, any legislation to date in terms of text. Um, it's likely that the Farm Bill debate in terms of markup of legislation will occur throughout the summer. Um, and finally, on the Senate side, the, the Senate Chairwoman, Debbie Stabenow from Michigan, uh, the Senate Agriculture Chair, uh, does not expect that her committee would complete action until either right before the August recess or sometime in, in the fall. Um, and with that, uh, we're happy to take any questions. Thank you, Tom. Any questions from the board members? Monica? 
sorry, I thought you were going to ask your question. No. Um, so the question that I have is on the four earmarks, what's the total amount? I can answer uh, that. The to total am oh. oh, go ahead. Thanks, Matthew. It's Thanks, Matthew. Yep. It's <laughs> $11.25 million. $11.25 million. Okay, thank you. Any other board member? I, Tom, I do have a question. Uh, the singling out of singles, in particular small mm -hmm. county, uh, what's the rationale behind that other than trying to save money? And I understand that part I, of it. I, yeah, it is, it is trying to save money. It's also, at least from uh, a number of Republicans on the, on both the House and the Senate, um, they believe that that individuals must must show uh, uh, so have have a job or show that they are involved in the community in order to receive those benefits. So, for instance, with respect to the thirty eight thousand or so that HHS estimates, and of course, there's probably some political judgment involved in terms of the actual numbers. But you know those 38,000 would not necessarily be uh, would lose coverage, but but the county would have to start keeping track of um, the hours work for those individuals in order to keep them on Medi-Cal. Um, so it's a little bit of a you know it's a savings proposition, and and uh, everybody needs to work for federal benefits uh, policy. Well, it, to me, it appears to be a shift in the burden. Who's going to cover the cost of keeping track of the, those individuals providing free voluntary hours to the community? And again, if they don't, then that population becomes part of the population we see in our clinics. So I don't see where, yeah, it may be saving the federal government, but it's going to cost the county. Correct, correct. You, you're, you're exactly right in terms of administrative costs. It, it's that kind of a proposal to track hours of individuals and have those individuals report those hours because if those individuals do not report the hours they will indeed end up in your in your clinics okay thank you any other questions you're no, welcome all right karen uh, good morning. Thank you for having me, Karen Lang with Shaiyoder and Tui Schmelzer and Lang. Um, just as a frame of reference where we are in the legislative process, the, um, we're in the middle of the, fis the non-fiscal bill hearing deadline. So any bill that didn't cost money that hasn't already been heard in the policy committee uh, has to be heard by the end of this week. And then there's sort of a pause button on policy committees meeting and what will happen basically you know, from next week until the end of May is going to be the fiscal committee meetings, which is appropriations. Um, that's sort of an undemocratic process where the committee will uh, evaluate the cost of the bill and then it will get parked normally on what's called the suspense file. And then one day at the end of, towards the end of May, around May 18th, uh, the committees will just move out the bills without much discussion uh, that, are, that the, the committee wants to move out and then they'll hold a bunch of bills, but there won't be uh, much discussion on that. And so then we'll move to the floor, and that's called the House of Origin deadline. So uh, once we get past the suspense file hearings, uh, the assembly floor and the Senate floor will be very busy moving all the legislation that they have agreed to move forward over to the second house. And concurrent with that is going to be what um, the budget committees have to do to respond to the updated uh, May revision of the governor's budget. This is when things start to get really real. Uh, is after the governor releases what's called the May revision. Uh, basically, it's an updated budget that's more reflective of the real, real um, financial situation that we're in. Certainly, because of the deadlines that have been extended for tax payment uh, for folks in disaster counties, we won't actually have collected all the money we're supposed to collect until sometime in October or the end of September. Uh, so we're going to be sort of playing with monopoly money between now and then. I mean, it's real money, but they're just, they won't have collected it yet. So there'll be internal borrowing to, to make sure everybody's uh, checks clear. Uh, so we'll be doing the budget, um, at least the first cut at the budget, uh, leading up to the June 15th constitutional deadline. I think it's very realistic to treat the May revision and the, sh and the first series of budget bills that we'll see going into June 15th is a first draft of the real budget because um, we have been in the last several years doing a second more substantive budget in August slash September before they shut down for the year. And it's probably just a matter of necessity that we do it that way this year because our revenue picture is murky. So 
Um, the, the end of May into the middle of June is very chaotic, and I'm sure your emails will be flooded with stuff from me, stuff from CSAC, and from your various affiliations asking for you to reach out to your delegation members on specific bills and budget items, just because at that point in the year, your direct uh, touch is critical to, because there's just so much happening your delegation cares a lot what you have to think. And so uh, you'll probably see quite a bit of that um, coming your way uh, on various topics. So that's sort of where we are broadly. Um, on the mental health, uh, specialty mental health, uh, Senator Dodd and um, Assemblymember Wilson have been working to connect with the Director of the Department of Healthcare Services on our ongoing concerns. That meeting was held about a week ago and we're working on setting up a debriefing with Senator Dodd uh, and your key staff uh, for later this week and trying to plot next steps. Uh, I don't think he heard anything new from the Department of Healthcare Services and so we've got to um, huddle internally and just keep on keeping on on that issue. Um, on, also on mental health, last time I was here, I had such lousy news for you on the potential overhaul of MHSA. There's still nothing really in print yet. Um, very briefly, there were two documents that almost went live and then didn't from the Health and Human Services Agency on this. And then uh, we've been checking daily to see when it's really real to look at. Um, but there's a very substantive uh, outline of what they're proposing that is supposed to drop any moment, and of course the minute that it does, <laughs> we will hit forward to all of you so you can take a look at it yourselves, but there isn't anything ultimately that new to report on that subject right now, but of course everybody's antennae are up waiting for it. Um, when, uh, when the governor does release his May revision, it's possible that the MHSA proposal comes with it, I'm not sure. We do have a reliable-ish rumor that um, as part of the May revision, um, he will announce sort of what he's willing to do in a resources bond. I've been talking to you guys every time I'm here about the fact that there's going to be, you know, 10, 12 bond proposals in the mix. Um, there, there are, uh, he's sort of let it leak that there could be um, his his needs, his wants in a, um, any sort of resources bond. That would probably corral together Assemblymember Villa Pudawas, Senator Allen, Senator Eggmans. Um, there are you know three sort of competing ones. Uh, certainly what's happening in other parts of the state with the big melt uh, are driving a lot of um, concerns and heightening pressure on the levy component and very specifically, which um, has you know a direct interest to you here in the Delta. So, waiting to see what's going to be in there. Um, on your sponsored legislation, AB 1345, your staff came. Um, I was sidelined with this little virus, but your staff was there and the bill got out unanimously. The realtors have um, been uh, articulating their concerns that the bill is too big of a bite, um, but we have not seen their specific suggested amendments yet. And I'm hanging close with your staff on that bill, but it did get out unanimously and will be heard in appropriations before the end of May. And um, the other thing that I did report on when I was here last time is this um, issue of what is happening with fentanyl. And I was um, you know, observing what your uh, jail commander was talking about with your, um, com your correctional officers having to carry Narcan. Uh, after I was here, there was a big sort of shift. And the legislature did, and the assembly agree to hear six bills in a special hearing last Thursday um, that covered a, a series of ways to try to address the fentanyl crisis. Four of the bills were passed. Um, I don't think that they're, I don't think anyone would say they're a panacea, but the legislature did seem to have a little bit of a change of heart in the assembly on moving some of the fentanyl bills forward. The Senate has potentially one bill. They technically don't have any right now, but I, I think that the, the public pressure on that issue is just continuing to grow and looking for the legislature to come up with some new solutions and ways to address um, the crisis that is in our communities right now. So that was a big change from the last time I was here. And with that, um, I'll, I'll stop talking and answer questions if you have them. Any questions from board members? And again, I don't have any cards on, on any of these items, so do we have any callers? Callers on the line, if you wish to speak on agenda item number 11, please press star three to raise your hand. Sir, we do not have anyone raising their hand. I, I wanna go back, because I started thinking about the, uh, the federal impact of that 38,000 people to the clinics itself, and if I could ask the jury to come up, I think right now the, our clinics are costing us between five and six million dollars a year, which is general fund expenditure. So I would ask, I would think that that if an additional population comes in, that it may increase that general fund contribution. 
Sure. Am I close to being? Sure. Let me start. Uh, I think your question, uh, Supervisor Vasquez, was on why single adults. The interesting thing nationwide, the majority of people on uh, Medicaid are children. It's hard to impose work requirements on children. So politically, really the focus on, is on adults, our single adults. We do face uh, basically a significant deficit in the context of uh, family health services, but this is not only our, our clinics, it's basically on the hospitals, it's on a uh, partnership health plan, all of the clinics. Um, I'm hoping it doesn't go through, but I think it's political, jockeying, um, see what happens in the Senate. Uh, but um, currently right now, we don't know if it's, I didn't know it was 38,000 uh, potentially to be impacted, but it does have an uh, impact on the whole healthcare system for sure. But all those costs we can't claim become a general fund contribution to continue the, the majority. Operation. Yeah, the majority of our funding for our clinics is Medi-Cal. So you take away Medi-Cal, basically it's gonna be, um, have to be county general fund that basically picks up the cost. I would just I want the board to consider to maybe writing a letter opposing both of those. Go ahead, Mary. Thank you, Chair. I wholeheartedly support that. I, I, I think it's really criminal, frankly, that they carve out single adults who have probably raised children, who maybe chose to be single for a reason, but find themselves in a situation where they may not um, be able to afford health care, uh, even with the Affordable Care Act. I happen to know a woman who, prior to the Affordable Care Act coming into place in California, expanding our Medi-Cal Medi um, coverage to single adults, she ended up having to have spinal surgery at UC Davis and is now medically um, uh, bankrupt because of that. If she could only wait like a month or two, she, it would have been taken care of. Uh, but you know, everybody needs medical care. I don't care what your status is, how old you are, um, what your marital uh, status is, any of that. I, you know, absolutely a letter. Um, I think a very uh, pushy letter because it really is leaving taxpayers. I mean, these are people who pay taxes, who have supported our, our uh, communities for a long time and, and you know, they're going to tell us we got to leave them in the lurch in terms of medical care? No. If I could just add, I'm on the NACO Health Committee at 12 o'clock. You know, basically, I'll be talking to them about this particular uh, legislation and see what NACO can do as well. Yeah, I don't know. <sighs> Thank you, Jerry. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Board. So, perfect. Matthew, what do you what do you want us to do next? Yes. So now uh, we have the report out from April 24th, the Legislative Committee meeting, and we have eight bills that were discussed at that meeting that we'd like to now bring together to uh, have full board consideration for your positions. Laid out nicely on this matrix before you is the actual bills, as well as the position that the Legislative Committee took. Um, so we also put together a high-level summary of the bill itself as well as the discussion that took place as part of the agenda packet that you received. And so we can go through those bills one by one if you'd like and go ahead and we'll take your direction. Let me ask, is there any board member opposed to the support position? If not, we can do those. Or, or, or no, this, so no, we'll any of the ones that, line. that have support out to the, call, out to the side. Oh, okay. See, on the, the support, supported by the Ledge Committee. Well, there's a couple of things on here that that was recommended that I not in. All right, we'll do one by one then. With the AB 50. So I'll move to support AB 50. Is there a second? Second. All right, it's been moved to second. Do you looking for public comment? Do you have any cards? Ask for public comment. Oh, okay. So ordered by a vote of 5-0. I'll move support of item AB 400, bill AB 400. Second. <laughs> so ordered by a vote of 5-0. And then I'll roll down. So, um, I'll uh, move to support AB 817. Second. AB 5, which one? Eight AB 817. I support that. Okay. Uh, 
And then I'll move SB 706 to support. So ordered by a vote of 5 0. Okay, we'll do AB 504. So I would like to speak on it. Sure. Okay. So the reason we couldn't come to an agreement one way or the other is that I support this particular bill because it if I can have my glasses on so I can read it. It allows, um, the bill would provide that it's not unlawful or a cause for disciplinary action against, against a state or local employee for that public employee to refuse to enter property that is a site of a primary labor dispute, perform work for a uh, public employee employer involved in a primary labor dispute. So. I understand the discussion that we had, but with my um, labor hat on, labor hat on, I don't cross picket lines. And I know as somebody who's gone out on strike twice that sometimes a bargaining unit might agree with you and they don't want to have to cross the picket line. So for me, I believe that AB 504 should be a support position. And we had a disagreement, which is why it's now referred to the board. Well, well, but that's a disagreement. I mean, yeah. <clears throat> Karen, do you know enough about it? Sure, and I'm, I'm glad to be here just in case. Yeah. The, uh, the bill is, uh, it came out of the UC Regents, the strike at the UC campuses last mm -hmm. fall, and uh, the graduate student instructors are represented by UAW. There are other bargaining units on campuses that are represented by different bargaining units and they express concerns that they wished to um, honor the picket line, but uh, their contracts prohibited them from doing so and so they sought legislation that would have allowed them to avoid going um, across the picket lines in their capacity, you know, it could be janitors or other, you know, st support staff on campus or the faculty, and so they wanted the right to not go on there. The bill itself only speaks to public agencies. It's not, um, doesn't apply to private labor unions. Uh, the concerns, I think, that are, have been articulated by CSAC, the league, um, the statewide associations that, that have public employee bargaining units is the impact on services that are not directly related to the bargaining unit that's striking. Um, so what could happen is, you know, other folks that don't show up to work because they don't want to cross the picket line but provide services to other parts of county government and that was the concerns that have been uh, raised is the impact on public services as a result of the, the strike. And that was CSAC's concern? Yes, and that's, um, I think, across the board. Uh, CSAC, I believe CSAC, UCC, RCRC, and the League, and the Special Districts Association, I think, have all um, weighed in, in with concerns and opposition. I do have a question to the chair. Yes, um, um, Karen, I, I wanted to know, isn't it already that certain um, um, departments are required to come to work, like for example, a nurse, a doctor, um, uh, based on, I, I thought that was, the only was it in law enforcement? I thought those are those areas that were required to come. I think if, I, I'm gonna be honest, I do, I'm in support with Supervisor Brown for AB 504, but isn't it re already um, written that certain, you know, services, individuals in these roles that provide particular services that are for life uh, and protecting the only, public the, safety. The only job classification that's exempt from the bill would be firefighters. I didn't see medical um, or anything like that in there. Only the firefighters are not allowed to um, not come to work. That's, the, that's what, as what the bill is in print right now. That's the only ones that are called out. But I, I couldn't speak to what's in your individual bargaining agreements now. Okay, thank you. Go ahead, Deb. Hi, Debbie Vaughn, Assistant County Administrator and Interim HR Director. So I have the HR Director hat on right now. Deb, move the mic a little closer. Is that better? 
Okay. So um, from an HR perspective, um, each of your negotiated MOUs have conditions in there as to when those units can strike. Um, for example, um, sample language from one says that during the term of the negotiated MOU um, that the members of that unit cannot strike. So the practical implication from this um, from a county operational standpoint is that your board could successfully negotiate agreements with the majority or all but one bargaining unit in good faith come to a mutual agreement and then if there is a dispute in one unit um, this this bill would effectively eliminate that um, no strike clause so it would mean that all of the other 18 units could um, essentially participate in a sympathy strike even though you have that clause in your MOUs. And so the concern from an HR standpoint is obviously how do you keep county operations going under that situation and also the concern that um, your board has negotiated, you know, presumably at this point in time um, in good faith, reached an agreement um, and has the right to expect that um, that agreement will be mutually honored on all parts. So we don't have enough management to run everything if everyone went out on strike. <laughs> no, we do not. <laughs> yeah, and I thought I thought that, uh, that we had worked those out in our agreements. Uh, again, there there are agreements with each one of the bargaining units, and it's worked well for us. I don't know what this other layer would do then, other than what you indicated that the potential impacts. Erin, did you? I'm not sure I understand the question. <laughs> oh, much appreciated, Chair. Um, I support uh, unions in our uh, bargaining units within our county family when they want to strike. I mean, that's 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 their thing. If they want to do it, they can do it. My challenge is is if other bargaining units then sympathetically join that strike because what it comes down to, it's not. It's not about not supporting the employees. It's about not supporting the people in our county who re receive services from the, the county. If, if our clinics are cleared out um, because of a sympathetic strike, well, then those are people, there are people and patients who are not going to be seen. And they could have a variety of health issues that need to be seen on that particular day. And this, supporting this, um, would essentially allow that type of activity to occur in many different departments in our county. So um, I, I, I think the message is clear that, or it should be clear that I support our bargaining units and their and their um, decision to strike. Should you know they feel that we are not bargaining in good faith at the table, um, but I can't support the sympathetic um, uh, striking because again. We don't have enough people to cover all those positions, and we are a service provider to the people in our community. And so um, for that purpose, I will oppose it. I'll offer a motion to oppose it. Any other questions? I, yeah, I, go ahead, Mitch. Um, so to our consultant, or, uh, uh, real quick, you said that the only Emergency responders that are covered right now, uh, to your knowledge, are firefighters? That's the most recent analysis for the bill, which is it's being heard tomorrow in assembly appropriations, and the analyses identify it's by reference in the labor code, and it says that's a firefighter, so it doesn't speak to the other. So, types. based on that, have, having been on the other side, the law enforcement side, um, there were many times when we might probably have liked to have been able to tell the county that we didn't feel negotiations were appropriate, but we still had to come to work. Um, and because of the exclusion of a lot of essential services along the same lines that uh, uh, Supervisor Hannigan was talking about, um, whether that be law enforcement or um, some of our specialty mental health needs like crisis and crisis uh, uh, prevention, suicide prevention, those types of things where people need immediate service. Um, <clears throat> I think I would offer the second to that opposition. Um, I absolutely support folks' right to strike. I, like I said, there were many times where we, not many times, there were several times where we <laughs> felt that, that uh, we would like to make our uh, uh, feelings clear to the board. I think you did, that. but you were wearing a different hat at that time. I was, different hat. <laughs> um, but we weren't allowed to, and I would not want to open that Pandora's box uh, uh, 
of opportunity for that type of uh, thing to occur and negatively affect our public. Um, it's just uh, very dangerous. So for that reason, I would oppose this. Thank and I would offer a second to that. Any other discussion? Go ahead, Monica. Um, so when my daughter was attending the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, they did go out on strike. And um, I understand everything that you guys are saying, but I'm looking at it from 30,000 feet up and over. And um, I just think that if we are doing what we need to do bargaining-wise, we should be fine. But I just, I just can't have a blanket statement and support that. So I will be not supporting the motion on the floor. So thank you. Thank you, Monica. It is an interesting discussion. Uh, as um, it's been indicated, everything we do is essential to the community. And that's our responsibility as, as county government. I, I do understand the other, the, the right to strike and the, the right to honor a picket line. As a member of retail clerks in the early 70s, the butchers went out on strike and the, the retail clerks honored the picket line. I went a whole month without having a paycheck honoring that picket line. That was my choice. But people had the opportunity to go get their groceries someplace else. County governments, we're the, the business we do is the only, we're the only ones that do that business. So uh, with that, I'm going to go ahead and, and um, more than likely vote yes for this. So well, any um, other discussions? I, I really cannot um, vote to oppose this. I think everyone has a right to uh, strike when they need to. And uh, not to say that uh, we are going to not support uh, giving people that opportunity. I've been a union worker myself as well, and uh, having the right to strike, I think it's important, and it sends a message to our our employees that we um, also care about them and the work that they're providing to our, our community. And if we are, like uh, Supervisor Brown had indicated, uh, bargaining well, we should be able to come to some agreements so that um, we can minimize strikes as much as possible. And, and that's just my uh, remarks in reference to this. Thank you. Well, there's five of us up here with five different opinions. <laughs> <laughs> you Mitch, said it right. Just really quickly, this does not affect a specific unit's right to strike. This, this affects their ability to, in sympathy to the strike, Correct. not show up. show up to work. Correct, because I want to be very clear on that. We are not, and I would not uh, um, uh, support uh, affecting a, any unit's right to strike. Th that's that is, you know, sacrosanct. But this is more about uh, coming to work in support or not in support. Okay. Correct. Correct. Okay. With that, we have a, a motion and a second. Please vote. So ordered by a vote of 3-2. And that's to oppose. Yep. To oppose, correct. <laughs> <laughs> right, with that, AB 595. There's an oppose. Anybody want to be different on the oppose? No, Chair, I'll, I'll go ahead and offer the oppose position on AB 595. Okay, second. is there a second? Second. We move in second, please vote. So ordered by the, the five zero. Thank you. With that, I move the opposed position on AB seven hundred two. Yep. Any discussion? Is there a second? Oh, a second. Also. Go ahead, Wanda. I wanted to give a comment that why I'm opposing uh, AB seven hundred two um, because I think in in theory it's it's good, but the way it is written and uh, by not supporting and, and maintaining our chief probation officers, that's the issue for me, and that's why I'm opposing it. Thank you. All right. We move the second. Please vote. So ordered by a vote of 5 0. Sixteen seventy-two. Thank you. Is there a second to that? 
Oh, I'll second it. Okay. Any other questions, comments? I, I do have a comment. Sure. Um, I personally have been an in-home supportive IHS as worker. I did it for multiple years, and um, and I'm looking at it from that perspective, being in that place and making sure that uh, as an in-home supportive services worker, you work really hard, but you're not always paid well, and you give a lot of time and energy to help maintain and keep people in their homes. And we, as a county, could not uh, effectively um, per give the care that we need if we did not have uh, IHSS workers. And so, for me, um, because I have been a worker, I've done this work, and, this, and I have worked for this county when I was only paid $11.87. So, I think they have the right to uh, bargain with with the state if they choose to versus the county, and so that's why I am in support of this of AB 167. Thank you. Thank you, Monica. So part of the discussion was that only the, that the feds only give us 50 percent, and the state gives us 35 percent, and the remaining 15 percent comes from the county. And if this goes through, the county would have to put more money in. If we could change it and have the feds give us greater than 50%, I'm whole in favor of you. My concern is, as we just, ha as we just talked about what might happen with the ACA and 38,000 folks, as well as the discussion we had a couple weeks ago when we met and talked about economic development to increase our general fund funding. So I, I hear everything that you're saying. My concern is I'm looking at what might happen down the road. Karen even talked about we're not even sure how much money is going to come in by October because of the LNU fire. I think all but three counties had to have, have, have extra time to get their taxes done. So I, I worry about it. I worry about what might happen with, with the feds in terms of defaulting. So right now, that's why I have to vote a support. Oh, I love this. That is why I'm supporting their post position. There we go. <laughs> In-home in support services is an entitled program. If you, if you qualify for a certain amount of hours, and, and yet, yes, it is a very cost-effective way of providing services and keeping people in their home, which is the whole premise of it. But it is very costly. And, you know, this was mandated to us, and it's a, a mandated... Uh, service that we have to provide. And so it has become, over the years, very expensive, particularly the last few years. Yeah. So. We had a motion? Yes. And a second. And we have a vote. Yep. So, Chair, can I just make a comment about Go ahead. I think the challenge, there's lots of challenges within home supportive services. It is an excellent um, a pathway for uh, people to take care of family members who uh, need care inside of their home versus um, putting them into an institution for care. Um, however, the pay mix, is, if you've heard a little bit about it, the federal government pays 50%, the state government pays a portion, and the county pays a portion of the employer cost. So this is to the person providing the services. In counties like Marin County or San Francisco County or richer counties who have bigger, fatter general fund um, dollars, you know, they can afford to pay their IHSS workers more. We just can't. And, um, you know, we've done our negotiations in the past, and sadly, we are not that county who has this robust general fund to be able to do this work. So um, I am going to support an opposed position on this particular item. And frankly, I think the whole IHSS system needs to be um, completely revamped, 100%, from the federal, the state, and the county governments. How that happens, I don't know. Um, somebody smarter than me is going to have to figure that out. But So I will be supporting the oppose. And, you know, wanted to your statement that that is probably the hardest negotiations we have when we're yeah. fighting over a freaking quarter or 50 cents an hour more, yeah. knowing that it impacts people's lives, just not only the caregiver, but the person that's receiving the care. And yes, there has to be a different pay mix in order for us to continue to provide this service to those individuals that essentially qualify for it. 
Anyway, there's been a motion and a second. I think we've all voted. Um, so ordered by a vote of 4-1. Oh, gosh, your first 4-1. to one. <laughs> it's Supervisor Williams voting. No. <laughs> Join the club. <laughs> Matthew, we're done? Yep, we're all done. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you. Thank you. Me too. Do we want to take a quick break? Since Wanda's. No. Huh? All right. Okay. With that, Madam Clerk, item 12. Receive the annual report on the goals and accomplishments of board created advisory boards pursuant to the board's advisory board principles and policies for the period ending December 31st, 2022. Consider the ad hoc committee's recommendations as a result of a review of the county's discretionary advisory boards and consider adopting a resolution to implement the committee's recommendations. Good morning, Ann. Good morning, Chair Vasquez, members of the board, Ann Putney, Principal Management Analyst in the County Administrator's Office, and I'm here to present to you the Solano County Advisory Board Report. Uh, next slide, please. This report is required to be presented to the board according to the advisory board principles and policies adopted by the Board of Supervisors in 2005 and amended in 2000. 10. This report actually covers the period of October 1st, 2020 through December 31st, 2022, and going forward, the reports will be based on a calendar year. The report consists of individual report outs from, the, from each advisory board, as well as their attendance sheet during the review period and a copy of their bylaws. All of these documents are included in your packet and are designed to update the board on the most recent goals and accomplishments of these advisory bodies to assist the Board of Supervisors in their evaluations. Next slide, please. Here is a list of the advisory boards that are subject to the principles and policies and therefore are included as part of this report. This report is typically on the consent calendar, so I won't go over each advisory board's accomplishments, et cetera, but I do want to clarify the vacancies on the matrix in your packet in case you have any questions. Next slide, please. Many of the advisory boards have existing vacancies. However, the incumbents typically stay in their seat until a new member is approved to take their place. So for example, you'll see here that the Ag Advisory Committee has 14 members, but 13 vacancies or uh, seats that have expired. However, because many of the members do not want to cause a potential hardship to the board, prior uh, by exiting prior to a new person being voted in, um, they will stay in that seat. So in this case, it means that only one of the nine positions you see listed um, actually has a current term. The rest of these positions have termed out but are awaiting replacement, so the board has more than one person on it. From this chart, you can see that a number of the advisory boards have a high vacancy rate. Any questions on the chart, or is that fairly? So it, it, by the term vacancy, you mean expired terms? <laughs> um, some of them do not have them filled at all. Some of them are expired okay. terms. So it's a combination, a combination. of the two. All right, thank yes. you. Okay, next slide, please. But they're all still able to meet their quorum. Typically, yes. All right. Okay. So the next piece is related to the ad hoc committee's recommendation to the full board on the continuation of these advisory bodies. Chair Vasquez and Vice Chair Brown provided their recommendation, recommendations for the staff report, which I will go over with all of you, as well as a brief synopsis of why, when and why the advisory board was created, as well as some information that was considered by the ad hoc committee. Um, Chair, Vice Chair, if you have any comments, please feel free to jump in. Next slide, please. Okay, the Nut Tree Airport Advisory Committee was established by the board in 2004, so it's not mandated. 
However, it does serve the purpose of economic development and facilitates commun communication between pilots, tenants, and the community. Therefore, the ad hoc committee recommends that maintaining this advisory board. Next slide. Go ahead. Go ahead. Sure. Part of it, too, is that the belief of the ad hoc, or at least I'll speak as one person of the ad hoc, is that this is also economic development, that the hope is that everything will, you know, the nut tree will grow and bring in support. So that's also another reason, in my mind, to keep it. Okay. Thank you. Well, since Monica weighed in. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing is that the airport um, is an enterprise fund. So those costs to support that uh, that committee is uh, absorbed by the the airport itself, and the airport is supposed to make a profit. So, therefore, because it is an enterprise account, it's able much able more able to absorb those costs. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that feedback. Next slide, please. Go back. Oh. Sorry, go back. <laughs> go back one slide, there we go. Okay. okay, Parks and Recreation Commission. This one was established by the board under county code and California government code, and therefore it's what I call indirectly mandated. Uh, the county code has delegated several functions to this advisory board, and for the last 23 years, it has served as the body that conducts the annual process to award fish and wildlife propagation funds grants. That is required by law as it, all proposed expenditures from these funds must first be reviewed by the county's Fish and Game Commission if the board doesn't review the expenditures themselves. The board has designated the Parks and Recreation Commission as the county's Fish and Game Commission. As such, the ad hoc committee recommends maintaining this advisory board. Okay, next slide please. So we have the Solano County Library Advisory Council, which was established by the board in 1968 to advise on all matters related to library services and is not mandated. However, the library is required to have an independent oversight committee for its Measure L funds. Some of the same people sit on both boards and rather than have two different boards, with one of them being discretionary, the ad hoc committee recommends restructuring the Library Advisory Council to merge it with the Measure L Oversight Committee. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, the Commission for Women's and Women and Girls was established by board resolution and is not mandated. It was established in 2018. The state created a commission on the status of women and girls and urged counties and cities to do the same to provide education, advisement, awareness, and recommend legislation on a variety of topics that impact women and girls. The ad hoc committee recommends restructuring this advisory board and transitioning it to an independent nonprofit with the assistance of county staff. Which I believe it already has. I believe it has as well. That they've trans transitioned to a nonprofit. No, they haven't. No. That there is a nonprofit that has been established in order to apply for grant funding. There is the commission, and mm -hmm. then there's the nonprofit of the commission. So we have speakers in the audience okay. who can provide us all with greater information. Okay. okay, next slide, please. The Alcohol and Drug Advisory Board was established in 1994 when services were siloed to ensure community needs for substance-related issues were met. However, substance use services are now fully integrated with mental health evaluation and treatment as a co-occurring condition. This is the state's model for counties and also a national best practice. The ad hoc committee's recommendation is to dissolve this advisory board. Next slide, please. Okay. Solano Partnership Against Violence, or SPAV, was designated as the county's domestic violence task force by the board in 1995 and is not mandated. In 1999, the board further designated the committee as the county's domestic violence Prevention, prevention council, which qualified it to receive support from Solano County. The work done by the partnership can be absorbed into the efforts of the Solano Family Justice Center. And it's important to note that uh, SPAV its membership no longer reflects the state's penal code to qualify as a domestic violence prevention council. Excuse me, my mouth's really dry this morning. 
Sure. It, the spouse membership no longer reflects the state's penal code to qualify it as a domestic violence prevention council or task force. Okay. Chair, what, why does it, what, why is that? The I membership. Will, I will ask Tammy Lukens, our uh, principal management analyst who works with spouse. Is it who's on the member or the lack of numbers of people on it or I'm not sure. So the penal code, um, <laughs> that was referenced when it was established in 1999 um, or 90, between 95 and 99 is a penal code. Um, I, I don't need those details. Okay. I just so, need clarification. Yeah, so on it's, it's a long list of specifics and they were on SPAV at that time. It's like a court judge, a civil court judge, a prosecuting attorney. The require, this, this, the, the statutory list, mandates. Yep, it lists what they are and those what, what communities they should represent. Correct. And that's not the and case those today. Are no longer and those appointments are from us or from staff or from who? Or nobody's applying? Though they, it's not, so our, our bylaws say that they can be on them, but that's not been who has been um, historically over the last 20 years. It's just transitioned away from that. And who makes those appointments? The board. And so individually, we have not made these types of appointments. Correct. Okay. And I think they're just not applying as well. Okay. Thank you. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, we have the Agricultural Advisory Committee, which was established by the board in 2000 as a result of the Summit on Agriculture Report and is not mandated. The committee currently studies problems of interest to the board. However, this is an area that does not need regular targeted and structured citizen input and may be better served with less formal or ad hoc public participation on an as needed basis. The ad hoc committee recommends dissolving this advisory board. Next slide, please. Yeah, go ahead. Oh. Sure. Is your mic on? I'm sorry, thank you. So our, when I was looking through the documents, it looks like this advisory board meets on a regular basis. Is that correct? I believe so. Okay. Many, many of the boards do meet on a regular basis. All right. And, but I, I'm just, well, I, when we get to discussion, I'll wait till we get to discussion because I'm not in favor of dissolving this particular committee. Uh, I think they provide a valuable service. I just used them not that long ago for a bumblebee issue in my district. Uh, I just think that we're just not utilizing them to our, our best ability, nor allowing them the opportunity to actually provide feedback to the Board of Supervisors. And I actually uh, once elected, my first ask was, why can't we reinstate this group wholeheartedly instead of dissolving it. And so I, I'm just not in, the, in favor of dissolving this particular community and this uh, group. And especially, it does not, I don't think it sends a good uh, message to the ag community, one. Uh, two, they provide an adequate service for us. I, I don't know if anyone up here is currently have a farm, but I, I know I don't. So, you know, those are just my concerns. Well, since you raised it, then we're going to begin the discussion on it. Okay. Thank you. Uh, go, go back to the Ag Advisory. Go back one slide, please. Yep. So, as you see, it was, it was established in 2000 by resolution. If you read the resolution, the resolution says that the committee will meet on issues that the board deems that should be given to them. The board means at a board meeting that those issues come to us and a majority of the board has to say they direct the Ag Advisory to meet. What happened is they started meeting all the time, not on issues that were being directed from the board itself. So it's, it's not for us independently to go ask them questions. It's for the board to decide what issues do you want to send to this Ag Advisory Committee. And the resolution says they will meet from time to time when it's appropriate that the board gives them direction to meet on a particular issue. Well, maybe it needs to be re repurposed so that, um, or re, you know, give it, I think oh, well, we need okay. to change how it's currently structured so that they can continue to have a voice in the community uh, and provide feedback 
to the board and to us on an individual basis, especially for me as I have so much growth coming into the valley, um, it would be beneficial, I know, for, for me uh, when I need help or, or they can bring concerns to us. So I, I just think perhaps we need to change how it's currently structured to give them those, that opportunity to actually speak and have a voice. And then those are just my thoughts on the, on the matter. Well, since 2000, nothing's precluded anyone from picking up the phone and giving you a call as a board member or sending you an email or as a, as a committee that's been meeting pretty regularly to send something to the board itself. So those preclusions have never been in place. So if you've not heard from them, I don't know what to tell you. Well, anyway, that's, let's that's move why on. I make that We're recommendation get, for us to change the, how the board is actually, uh, that committee is actually uh, set up. So I think that's something that should come back to us for further discussion than just dissolving them uh, well, all together. Today. We'll move on to the next slide. Okay, next slide, please. The Historical Records Commission was established by the board at the request of the History Roundtable in 1987 and is not mandated. Its purpose is to serve in an advisory role to the board regarding the preservation and accessibility of the county's documentary heritage. The county has secured and preserves its historical records on a continual basis and has a record retention policy that complies with legal requirements and staff to address this. The ad hoc committee recommends dissolving this advisory board. And that summarizes all the ad hoc committee's recommendations and I ask if there are any questions. So any questions before I call them? The speakers? Okay. So I do have seven speaker cards, and if anyone else wishes to speak. Callers on the line, if you wish to speak on agenda item number 12, please press star three to raise your hand. Callers on the line, if you wish to speak on agenda item number 12, please press star three to raise your hand. So we do have callers raising their hand. How many do we know? Uh, three currently. Okay, well, we're gonna have the eighth speaker card right now. Uh, maybe the ninth. Sorry, we have 10 speaker cards and three callers. Uh, there's been a request on some of the cards to have additional uh, minutes added to their, um, uh, their presentation. I'm not going to do that. With that, we have at least 39 minutes, 40 minutes of discussion, just at three minutes apiece. Okay, the first speaker is Tony Wade. Good morning, Chair Vasquez and members of the um, supervisors and all y'all. Uh, my name is Tony Wade. I, uh, I write a column for the Daily Republic on um, local history for the last 12 years and uh, 30 books on it as well. And uh, I was asked to join the fight to save the Solano County Historical Records Commission, which is, appears to be on the chopping block today. And I'll let those who have actual experience with the commission uh, speak for themselves. But as a, a local accidental historian, I can speak passionately about how important our history is. Um, I get it. As supervisors, you're tasked with prioritizing resources. Um, I just reject the, seemingly, uh, the seeming underlying principle that doing away with the commission seems to imply that our collective history isn't as important as other things that contribute to the health of a region. Uh, to be sure, commerce, uh, infrastructure, and such are necessary to have in place as they're the lifeblood of a county, but art, music, and history are vitally important to its soul. Um, this isn't just some touchy-feely thing either. This is, um, these records with uh, proper oversight can uh, positively impact the lives of Stano County residents in numerous ways. Uh, that is, if the method requests for them are handled in a more efficient, uh, which is a separate but related issue, manner. Uh, complying with all legal requirements, as the slide said, uh, is not synonymous with serving the uh, community efficiently. The uh, passion for doing this work comes from volunteers, and that helps uh, with the efficiency. Uh, someone who relies on having access to documents and other artifacts from the past to help translate the history of Solano County to you guys as constituents, I urge you not to do away with the Solano County Historical Re Records Commission. Thank you so much. Thank you. Mr. DeCaro?
Supervisors, thank you, honorable supervisors. Um, if I could just interject a couple ministerial things first before my time. Um, the first being I submitted letters, individual letters to each of you this morning, and I ask that those be included in the public record. And second, uh, there is a petition on change.org. It's actually very fluid. I can't keep up with it. It's growing bigger and bigger that has the support of last I checked, 686 people. So this is a broad supported thing, uh, important matter. And so I want, it, want you to know that the voices of those people need to be included too. With that said, let me begin. We are a state mandated commission. That is not accurate. We are state mandated by California Government Code Section 26490. And we're actually the only mandated commission referenced in the Board of Supervisors provisions. So that is inaccurate. Well, let me stop you right there and I'll ask County Council to respond to that. Thank you, Chair. I'm pulling it up. I believe that it is permissive. It is not mandated. Um, therefore, if it was a mandated program, the state would obviously be compensating you for the cost associated with it, which is why the state said that you may have one, but it is not a mandated program. There are two alternates for the provision. Either way, it's important enough that it's codified. I, I do not disagree that it's not codified. I'm just saying that it is not mandated in the sense of that you must have it is uh, mandated in the sense of it allows you to have. Well, as what we believe to be a state mandated commission, we do not believe this is a warranted or legal action. A concerted effort has been made to silence us. Last year, our annual report was not submitted on our behalf to you. This year, we were told staff would be writing re our report or editing it for us something that we held firm against, and yet the attached attendance roster you have is not the one we prepared. And it goes counter to the advisory policies and procedures for commissions to write their own reports. An action of merit is transparent, provides thorough analysis, involves all impacted parties, includes open dialogue, and most importantly, is truthful and fact-based. Approving this resolution will have catastrophic consequences to our historical records collection, public accessibility, and public transparency. Keeping our commission and removing unwarranted impediments will reap great benefit. It opens avenues to significant grants and state and national resources, including free trainings from the State Advisory Board for Historical Commissions, it identifies records that although may not be prudent to retain by the county presently, would make sense to go uh, to be shared. So this covers not only existing records, but future records. It supports tourism, education, and public transparency. And we've developed collaborative relationships. And we cost the county nothing. We cost them nothing. We offer our free services to you, which is decades of experience, which is covered in your letter that I sent to you today. So I ask you, please don't vote for this. We serve a useful and relevant purpose, more relevant today than when we were established. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Ms. Vargas. Good morning, I'm Patty Vargas, uh, and I am here to speak about the potential impact of dissolving the ADAB. I am an unwilling participant in the war on drugs. I have been educated by the experiences that have devastated my family. I don't have any clinical abbreviations after my name, but I know more about drug use, policies, bureaucracy, and death than I ever wanted to. My son Joel began using substances as early as 15. Like many families, I assumed it was a phase that he would grow out of. When we finally realized he needed help, we had no idea where to turn. I know now, and my colleagues that are here with me today are well versed about what systems are in place. But if you're not in the know, you don't know what you don't know. 
The first time we sent Joel to rehab, it cost $45,000 for 30 days. He was coming down from a three-day meth binge and had been asleep for days. Terrified, I literally Googled treatment centers and up popped the gold-plated kind. At the time, I didn't realize that the amount of money you spent didn't equate to quality treatment. So after an intervention with family and friends, they whisked him away to what I thought would fix him. And when we couldn't ante up another $45,000 for another 30 days, they handed us a printed list of sober li living homes and said, good luck. So you might be saying, why didn't you call the county? Why didn't you call SAMHSA? Because I didn't even know that was available. I had no idea there was a SAMHSA. This was not a world I knew. He wasn't on our insurance anymore, so I just assumed we had to pay out of pocket. And when you think your kid is dying, you don't shop around. Instead, we put it all on credit cards, took out a second mortgage, and eventually lost our home. So how did we learn there were other options? Well, Joel wasn't fixed after 30 days. and the next few years, he attended several county-based rehabs courtesy of the state of California following a jail stay, rehabs that were not available to anyone other than those exiting the jail system. Joel lost his battle with substance use disorder in 2017. His little sister, Becca, was with him and spiraled down into her own frightening meth and heroin addiction. But because we had learned with Joel, our search was for low cost or state county funded programs. I watched both Joel and Becca do what we came to call dialing for beds. Provider number one has a bed available, but they won't take you unless you're detoxed, and guess what, there's no detox beds available. So by the time one opens up and you're detoxed, provider number one no longer has an open bed. Provider number two won't take you unless you're high because they require that detox happens under their care as part of their program. I literally took Becca to get high one time, hoping they would accept her. Desperate parents do desperate things. Treatment needs to be readily available the minute someone says yes. That is a very small window of time, and the more barriers are, are put in the way, the less likely it will happen. Families and victims of this disease should not be forced to search the internet for resources. They should be easily accessible. Thank you. Becca continued in her addiction until I was sure we would lose her too, and when she finally said yes, I took her out of state because they said yes the minute I called. We must do better. Thank you. Ramon, I'm going to mess up your last name, but you know. No problem. Uh, Chair Vasquez. Yes, sir. Uh, Ramon Costablanc and board members. So uh, the stories you just heard about Joel and Becca are one of many stories that we are now facing in Solano County. Uh, just look at some recent data. Uh, we have some information on how many people are going to emergency departments with opioid uh, uh, overdoses, right? Well, actually, as of just a year ago. Uh, in June of 2022, and that's the last month for which I have data, uh, 85 people uh, OD'd and turned up in emergency departments in just four hospitals in this county, three a day. The number has probably gone up since then. Uh, we now know from Partnership, who has our drug Medi-Cal contract, that over the last three years, they have uh, paid for care for 2,037 people uh, with uh, uh, most likely fentanyl problems. They don't have a box that they can check for fentanyl on their, other, on their uh, form for why is this person here. So it's other opioids, but they said most of the time that's fentanyl. 2,000. 37 in the last three years in Solano County. That's two a day. Uh, we know that the deaths due to uh, opioid uh, overdoses has gone up uh, exponentially over the past five years. Uh, the rate three, five years ago was 1.8 per 100,000. Last year, the last year for which we have data, it was 15.3 per 100,000. That is an eight-fold increase in opioid overdose deaths in this county in the last five years. We desperately need treatment set up in this county. Uh, all the, the people I've talked to, by the way, say that, you know, anecdotally, uh, all those numbers have gotten worse in the last 12 months. Those are, those are uh, the data that I can only get from, uh, you know, 2022. Uh, so if you look at the opioid uh, settlement agreement uh, that the county has gotten, 
uh, some money from what the agreement has in it under Appendix E is a list of priorities, approved uses. What is this money for? And what this money is for, quite clearly, is treatment. We need more treatment. We need to save people's lives, people who are going to die if we don't get them treatment. Uh, the first thing they suggest is that, not suggest, it's part of the court order, is MAT. The second thing is uh, recovery care, continuous recovery care. Uh, ideas like, let us say, school programs, uh, the, the list of approved uses goes A through L. A is treatment. G is where you first find something like a school program. So I understand the county's talking about school programs getting more money out of this uh, uh, settlement fund than uh, uh, treatment. And uh, that, that's just terrible. Now, oh, by the way, uh, on the ADAP, you, uh, you noticed that uh, we had uh, six vacancies. We also have six volunteers, six applicants, and they've been there for months, some of them for over a year. So the vacancies are due to county inaction. So, uh, well, I'm going to ask you to ramp, ramp it up. I mean, yeah, wrap sure. it up. Sure. Not ramp it up. Uh, no, that's fine. I think, I, think, I think you're doing that already. <laughs> yeah, no, I was right there on my last Yeah, point. you are. Okay, I'll take uh, 10 extra seconds here. Thank so you. the ADAB has been focusing on uh, treatment ideas now for the last six months before we were shut down uh, in response to the court order. Treatment is a priority. Treatment's what we're working on. If you cut off ADAB, you cut off treatment, and it will be a tragedy. Thank you. The next speaker is Denise Coleman. Good morning. Good morning. I want to thank um, the Board of Supervisors for hearing us um, and thank Solano County for everything they do and thank the board members. Um, for my idea, coming up here, um, first I want to, first and most, I want to acknowledge all the peers that we lost in the last year from drug um, addiction. I just lost another one last week, so I just want you to know that is something that sits on my heart. Um, what I've learned from sitting on this board and going back and forth to the mental health board is that we have to have a better way of com communication. Um, we do need people that represent the programs on the board. Um, as I volunteered for Dignity Day and what I learned and saw beautiful that I have not seen before is us educating the community as a family or together. They were out there to serve the homeless and it was something about giving out the NARCAM to the families and teaching them one-on-one, -on -one, face to face, and actually walking them through the process on how to save somebody. We do not have NARCAM in every car in the county. We do not have them in every room and board. We do not, and I keep asking myself, what could I have done to serve my job better to educate the people that I worked with? And why didn't every person I worked with not have NARCAM in their bedrooms or in their programs? So these are things that we learn as we grow. As we grow. Um, the ADAB, we have lost too many people in our county. So this is one board that I think needs to be probably revamped and we need to be heard, but we need some help to get that done and um, for everybody on both ends because I believe everybody's trying to make a difference. Um, I don't think it's a program that should be dissolved because there's too much going on in our community right now and the homeless are being swept up under out in the bushes. So we have to be present. They need to do better. We need to do better. And the county needs to do better. So we all need to work together. And that's all I want to say about that. So please don't dissolve this program. We just need to figure out how to get over the hurdles to get things done. Um, because I, I've seen things get done here. And it's been amazing. But this is one thing that needs to be done. And, but it needs to be done correctly. And I just don't know how to get to that point or how to get people to communicate correctly. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Carol Dunn. Uh, good morning to the board and the chair. Um, I'm a member of ADAB and I'm also a substance use navigator in a major hospital emergency department in Vallejo. Um, I oppose the adoption of Resolution 2023 and Resolution 94-191 to dissolve the Alcohol and Drug Advisory Board and urge the board to reconsider this resolution. Um, ADAP plays a crucial role in Solana County, um, especially during a fentanyl crisis with overdose deaths increasing around the country. And it would behoove the Board of Supervisors and County Behavioral Health to keep ADAP intact um, and to continue saving lives. Um, 
ADAB meets uh, once a month. We meet with Drug Safe Solano. We sit on the steering committee of the Opioid Coalition as well as participate in Drug Safe Solano's work groups. And we work with Drug Safe Solano collaboratively. Um, the Substance Use Navigator Program was started by ADAP, and that's uh, placing three substance use navigators in all emergency departments in Solano County. Um, we work with all substance use um, disorder patients that come in, and we refer them to treatment programs, detox, residential, outpatient, MAT treatment. We have about a 95% success rate of placing these patients into treatment, which is miraculous. This was not there before um, ADAB um, orchestrated getting the sons into Solana County Emergency Department. So this was a huge program. Um, we also um, were seeing huge reversals um, in overdoses, over, um, opioid overdoses in the emergency department, and that's the Narcan program. And the Narcan program is another ADAB program where um, sub we get it for free from DHCS, and we supply all the stakeholders in Solana County with Narcan, um, mental health court, drug court, um, the county, the HOPE program, um, shelters, um, we're t working with Drug Safe Solano to get the Narcan into the schools, and we also go to all of the events in Solano County and health fairs, and we educate the public on how to administer Narcan when somebody has overdosed. So again, ADAB is a huge um, game changer in the fentanyl crisis and opioid um, reversals in this county, and we wanna continue doing this. Um, there's other projects that ADAB is doing in addition to the Narcan program and the SUN program. Um, we have a free phone program. We're um, working with T-Mobile and we're able to supply unhoused patients with free phones, um, 15 a week and, it's, and, and can increase at any time. This is just starting, which means those patients that are coming in unhoused, we can connect them to detox, to treatment, to housing, to shelters. Thank you. Um, and again, just want to urge the board to um, not vote for this resolution to keep um, ADAB intact. Thank you very much. Thank you again. Edmund Fitzgerald. Thank you, Mike. Yes, I'm here to speak specifically to um, the Solano County Historical Records Commission. I went online, I looked at your staff reports um, from the ad hoc committee, uh, and it was woefully inadequate. Uh, first off, there are no alternatives listed for this, such as for the others, such as AG, the Women's and Girls, and SPAV. Uh, it just simply seems that they just want to eliminate it. I'd like to know, what is the cost to the county for retaining this? That wasn't listed. Uh, there are no pertinent factors listed as to why this is unnecessary. It says here under the factors considered by the ad hoc committee that the county has secured and preserved its historical records. That's all fine and dandy, but I would assume that because this is the county, there are more records that are being preserved than just simply governmental records. Uh, I think all that needs to be considered. Um, I uh, want to know what proof is there that the service that was needed in 1987 still isn't valid today? Nothing from this ad hoc committee listed any of those items. I believe, um, as uh, Ms. Williams was saying, that these uh, decisions on many of these committees, including uh, the people that spoke eloquently on the medical items and what should be uh, postponed until answers are provided to all of these things. Um, I think that's all, all I really have. I think it, it's uh, uh, not a wise decision just to summarily dismiss these commissions that have been in place for over 40, well, not quite 40 years, 37 years now, or 36 years. Um, I'd like to get some answers from either the board or from the ad hoc committee as to the questions I posed. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Next speaker is Jack Batson.
Hello, Supervisors and CAO. I'm Jack Batson, citizen of Fairfield. I'm speaking today for my wife, Leslie, who is out of town. She spent 11 years professionally managing the Solano County Archives pro bono. She would <clears throat> have much to say about the fate of the Historical Records Commission and the historical records themselves were she here. Solano is a historically significant county. 49ers passed through Solano on their way to the gold diggings. Many returned to establish farms and make Solano the breadbasket of California. Solano's wheat was shipped around the world. When California became a state in 1850, Solano was one of its original counties. Early settlers left records documenting not only their lives, but the rich history of the space that we call home. In the 1980s, citizens rescued these records from courthouse basements, closets, and warehouses. A prior board of supervisors supported the effort, and in 1987 created the uh, Historical Records Commission to ensure the proper preservation and oversight of this rich treasure trove. Many California counties have no such historical collection. Courthouse fires, basement floods, and too often just careless disregard resulted in the loss of irreplaceable historic documents. Please don't let Solano County join the list of those counties. As a professional archivist with a master's degree in archival science, Leslie was proud to help preserve and organize the collection. She supervised volunteers who created fund finding aids to facilitate research services for a wide range of patrons, other government agencies, scholars, historians, and folks seeking to flesh out their own Solano County roots. Leslie, Leslie hoped that one day uh, county leadership would look upon the archives as a source of civic pride. Unfortunately, there were too many times when she had to deal with a misguided stealth campaign by staff to dismantle and effectively destroy the collection as a cost-saving measure. In 2008, staff went so far as to put the dismantling of the collection on the board's consent calendar. Citizens rallied in protest. The board rejected the recommendation and instead directed staff to work with the commission uh, to move the collection from a filthy surplus warehouse that had endured a flood to a clean, climate control facility on Chadbourne Road. In October 2008, the deputy state archivist spoke at the grand opening. But in 2015, the boom finally fell. Staff told the commission that the lease for the Chadbourne facility was ending and offered a hollow reassurance that the new home would be fine, found. Instead, staff directed Leslie to prepare the collection for removal to an inaccessible record storage facility in Contra Costa County. County staff also shut down the archives website, replacing it with a link on the county website for citizens to make historical records requests. Is there time? Is it time? Jack, wrap it up, go ahead. Okay, let, let me jump to the last uh, paragraph. To be brutally honest, today is the collection's 11th hour. And importantly, your decision regarding the commission will determine your own legacy. This will be the board that allows, will this be the board that allows the destruction of an irreplaceable historical asset to save a few dollars? Or like past boards, will you clearly understand that your job is to deal with the past as well as the present and future? Solano's past is too historic and valuable to be lost forever. And thank you for the extra time, Chairman. Thank you, and thank you. Uh, thanks, thank Leslie, too. Next speaker is Ian Anderson. And I have one more speaker card after that, if someone wants to. Oh, here we go. Morning, Board of Supervisors. Uh, Ian Anderson, fourth generation farmer in the Montezuma Hills. Uh, I'll have to start with saying giving each, getting rid of what might be four ag hog committees and giving us three minutes to do it doesn't seem very comfortable out here in the public. And this democracy, you're getting people who care about this county, people who want to do good things, and I'm hearing these stories, and I'm, we're getting advice from the ag hoc committee that to shut them down, that might not be your best solution to instantly get rid of these, including in the ag advisory. My, in the historic part of it, my great grandfather was one of those farmers who grew wheat for the San Francisco. I mean, it's just, there's the history in this county is really important. Uh, last night, I went to a Farm Bureau meeting, and it was, talk, it was about agriculture, of course, and important topics. Uh, Supervisor Mashburn was there, and we were talking about the economic activity of uh, 
agriculture in this county, $1.6 billion. So my topic here this morning is the question of dissolving the Ag Advisory Committee. Uh, four days ago, our committee was let by Ed King was known that we were, were going to be dissolved. But a more important, in January 4th, there was a letter which I will give to you that was sent to Ed King from the Ag Hoc Committee. And basically, it discussed, discussed the Ag Advisory Committee and how it wasn't functioning as well as they would like to. Uh, as Supervisor Williams brought up, well, maybe we can relook at this group, this Ag Hoc versus just dissolving it. And because your letter to us on what we were doing, and you could see improvements, start to say with, with your office to identify issues with the AAC, basically you're saying, hey, let's do it better. But here, four days ago, we're telling, let's dissolve it. That's two total different situations. We on the Ag Advisory, on this $1.6 billion of activity, are an important role. We are the citizens, the farmers in this area, that can give advice. Whether we meet monthly or whether we get advice from the board is something that we should look at. But dissolving us is not a good decision. It does not look good. Last night, we were talking about how great ag was in the farm community. The next day, we're getting rid of the ag advisory. It just doesn't sit well with me. So I, I think it, on all of these committees, it just seems, appears to me that they might be good advice. Maybe things need changing, but just dissolving them in one quick meeting not a good decision. So I hope you guys take that into consideration. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Jeannie McCormick. Jeannie? I'm Jeannie McCormick and um, live in uh, outside of Rio Vista. My husband, Al Medvitz, and I have been farming there for um, over 30 years. I'm a third generation farmer in that area. And I, <laughs> I can never say, I can never top what Ian Anderson has said in any realm of our lives. <laughs> so I can simply say that um, the agricultural community in Solano County is going through a very devastating time now. Um, I don't, I'm sure that you all know about it, um, and maybe you don't. There is a very well-heeled buyer who is coming out and buying up all the farmland for, uh, for prices that do not relate in any way to the real market. And agriculture will be gone in the Montezuma Hills. Um, I hope not. <laughs> but it, it could be before I die, and I just cannot bear that. We need, we need to, um, to, to marshal our agricultural human resources in this terrible situation. And, um, and that's what the Agricultural Ag Advisory Committee has been. My husband, I think, is still on it. Um, I've served on it. It's just a fantastic way of sharing information among farmers who are involved in very different enter enterprises. And um, I, you know, just if there, I don't know if there are many, I, I haven't been to a meeting for a long time. Uh, because I've been taken up with all this damn Flannery stuff. But uh, I really hope that you keep this. Uh, I, actually, I think what Ian has said is that I don't think any of these committees ought to be uh, dissolved. I mean, historical records? Good God. Do you know how much farming information <laughs> there is in those? And these, oh, the poor, oh, the poor parents of these kids who are just in such trouble and it's so hard to find. Anyway, I don't think, I don't like bureaucracy, but I do like democratic small d um, 
participation in, in the county business and the county politics. I hope that you will keep our committee. Um, we need it. We need it desperately right now. And um, I hope that you will help all these other people with these really great Chair, things. Time. So thank you very much. Sorry, you, my husband isn't here. He talked more than I do. <laughs> Chris Jacobson is the next speaker. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Chris Jacobs, and I'm the creator of Vallejo Historic Homes. This is a website for the buying and selling of older homes in Vallejo, but also for homeowners. There's a ton of resources on there, all kinds of guides and things like this. I have over 500 images of high-resolution maps people download, and I talk to people all the time about how much they want to uh, research their house, how much they want to <clears throat> learn about the history of our town and learn about the history of our county. I know that that information is important to them. Uh, and I know that uh, just from talking to people and, and they ask me how can I go about getting more information. I've, I've linked to as much as I can find. And I want more information to be available to link to, to share. In my estimation, our records, it's not like lunch, like every day we want lunch and we use them. But when people need these things, they're really important. And they're actually also priceless. There's no way we can put a valuation on them. So I would like to see them preserved, and I urge you to do the same. So is your assumption that they're not being? My assumption is that this group advocates for that preservation. And I've watched somewhat in their advocacy, and I've seen them stifled in their advocacy. And I'd like to see that advocacy continue so that those records can be preserved. Uh, it doesn't have to be preserved in one way, but I'd like to see them preserved and archived and made available to everybody. So when you talk about maps, are you talking about assessor's maps or? The maps on my website are, the, the main ones are the Sanborn maps. So I've downloaded a high resolution scans of all of the Sanborn maps in Vallejo. There's five of them. Uh, my maps are in color and they're freely available for anyone who wants to download them. Another big maps collection I got that is really important to people is a, uh, a giant book of hand-drawn subdivision maps. The original subdivision maps, oftentimes street names were different. Uh, I'm currently, I'm a realtor, I'm currently selling a house in uh, Fairmount Parks, and there's a park right next door to the house. And on that map, it was a school, and the school was never built. You know, just these little tiny bits of story. We talk about history and people forget that in the inside of the word history is the word story. So. Well, my point is that those maps are all s s under the care of the assessor's office. Which oh, is yeah, yeah, for certain. Yeah. Well, that's a different set of holdings. Oh, I understand that those are different archives. My point is when, my point is that in my work, I find people coming to me all the time and talking about how important the records are and how important the story of maybe their house, their town, their county. People tell me stories all the time. You know, my father was one of the settlers and he was a farmer. You know, uh, he was a rancher. Uh, my, my family owned this home in the 1800s. Those are the kinds of things I hear from people and I want to urge- Thank you for doing that. The commission to, to uh, protect this commission. That's what, that's what I'm here today. Thank you very much. Edith Thomas is the next speaker. And then we have three callers. Okay. Right. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Edith Thomas, and I'm the past chair of the Solana Commission for Women and Girls. Um, thank you for letting me speak. The Solana Commission for Women and Girls was created in 2018. Considering the pandemic, we are we are a relatively new commission. In that time, we have created a status report to identify the issues facing women and girls in our county. We have honored women each March, gathering thousands of period products and distributed them to unhoused women and are holding out, I'm sorry, holding our third event um, to the high disparity in birth outcomes for women of color in this county. We are just getting started, thank you. We are just getting started as a commission. Knowing that we did not want to be a burden on the county, some former members created a nonprofit, and because of that nonprofit, we were just awarded $25,000 
um, a grant from the state commission. We can multiply county efforts and leverage state funds and bring them into Solano, but this is only possible if we stay under the county umbrella. We can and will hire staff, and we, we would like to stay as the, county com as the county commission to allow us to grow without placing any burden on the county. Um, on Saturday, this birth justice event, we were able to get a grant from Kaiser that will fund the whole event. Um, being able to do that, I mean, the county doesn't, hasn't wanted to give us money to hold these events. And so being able to access that money outside using the status that we are part of the commission from the supervisors appointed by the, the community, that's been really important when we write the grants because it shows these outside funders that we have community support and that there's a purpose for us. So um, we have some positions open and we've been waiting for recommendations. And I'll tell you, finding youth to be on our commission has been a challenge. And we've reached out and finding committed young women who want to pursue opportunity and leadership has been tough, but that's, that's gonna grow us in the future. So I appreciate you letting me share. Um, most all of you have someone appointed on the commission and it's vital to the success, I believe, for the rights of women and girls in Solano County going forward. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now call on the, the call on the callers. Callers on the line. If you wish to speak on agenda item number 12, please press star three <coughs> to raise your hand. Callers on the line, if you wish to speak on agenda item number 12, please press star three to raise your hand. Caller with phone number ending in 88, Please press star six to unmute yourself and state your name if you wish. Hello, everyone, uh, Chairman, Honorable Board Members. My name is Deanna Allen. I have been a lifelong uh, resident of Solano County. I am here today as a member of ADAB and also an applicant for the third time whose uh, application this third time around has been pending for eight months. Um, I wanted to just implore the board to please reconsider dissolving this. The, the, this ADAB was established to assure, I love that word, assure that we address drug and alcohol misuse through prevention, treatment, and recovery. As a woman with 30 years of sustained recovery, um, I can tell you that uh, no to low cost prevention and recovery is totally possible. It's community set. Um, listening to our agenda today, substance use disorder crosses over corrections, child care, collecting taxes for the people that are unemployed and incarcerated, foster care when our children are caught up in systems due to substance use disorder. I'm a direct service provider and I work with four generations at a time almost daily. I feel that the advisory board is a place where lived experience and people who eat, sleep and breathe substance use alone can be heard. I personally bring free consulting to this board. I've been involved with the White House at invitation from President Obama when the opioid task force was initiated. I've overseen SAMHSA grants. I'm currently working with Department of Healthcare Services on another for substance use, AB 109. I was at our state capitol as part of the governor's select hearing committee. These, our voices are important and the one ad hoc committee reason to dissolve it that now it's looked at as behavioral, in my personal and professional opinion, that would be like saying, let's treat all cancer patients and diabetes sufferers in the same category. These are two different things. Substance use needs to be looked at separately from mental health, yes, and the broader spectrum. We can have conversations about behavioral health but many of us that are sitting on this board and meeting on our volunteer time are specifically focusing at the lives that we're losing. Opioid is just the current conversation. I've been here before it was opioid. We now have Trank, we now have ISO. I've been at so many young people's funerals and I've watched so many babies born uh, addicted. We cannot, especially right now, dissolve this and not have the community input for this very specific topic. 
I implore you, please do not dissolve this. Restructure it if needed, but do not dissolve it. And thank you, everybody. Thank you. Caller with area code 916 and phone number ending in 11. Please press star six to unmute yourself and state your name if you wish. Caller with phone number ending in, or with area code 916 and phone number ending in 11. Please press star six to unmute yourself. Okay, moving on to the next caller. Caller with phone number ending in 14. Please press star six to unmute yourself and state your name if you wish. Caller with phone number ending in 14. Please press star six to unmute yourself and state your name if you wish. Caller with phone number Area code 415, phone number ending in 11. Please press star six to unmute yourself and state your name if you wish. Hi, uh, my name's Elise Minion. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Thank you so much. So, um, so I, I have a couple of questions and then a couple of comments. So, so number one, just, just based on some of the public comment I'm hearing, uh, especially from those persons that served on these various commissions, I was just curious, when the ad hoc committee was created to make an assessment on what to dissolve and what to reorganize, I, I, I'm just not clear like how the ad hoc committee came about. So if that happened in a meeting, I, I, I missed it, I'm sorry, but I think it would be helpful to find out how the ad hoc committee came about and then what was the process in notifying the all the persons that serve on the commission what was the notice they were giving how much notice they were given regarding the you know impending uh proposal to dissolve their entity or reorganize it and then you know maybe going forward hopefully everything is just sort of tabled today and nothing happens at a minimum hopefully and then it sounds like what would be a good idea is to include the commissioners and and have a meeting with the ad hoc committee to really under, come to an understanding why, what is the, the, the main primary purpose for dissolving, um, if what what is really kind of the issues that compelled this proposal. So if it's a lack of resources on the county's end, I think one speaker spoke already about potential grant opportunities. You know, maybe, and, and I had written an email, there's certainly grant opportunities for the Historical Records Commission. And I think it's important to do all the research you possibly can so that you could find funding sources and that those funding sources uh, will not only help carry out the, the objective of the commissions, but maybe also relieve some of the resource issues on the county side, if that's really the case. And then also I think it's important to know for all these commissions, who is the employee at the county that's primarily responsible for facilitating? Is it, is, is it their work? Is being, are they overwhelmed? I mean, I think that once we get an understanding, what are the, what are the problems and how can we resolve this? Because, and you know, I, I'm, I advocate for transparency and citizen stakeholder participation because that's how uh, we come to good outcomes. The entire community benefits with more citizen stakeholder participation, right? We all can't be elected officials. We don't have that power. So, but, but having these commissions, I think it, it helps alleviate resources and it could really help the community. So that, those are my suggestions, but in my email, I was sure, advocating time. to say that, uh, I'm sorry, my time is over. Yes, thank you. Well, if you could, if you could address the concerns in my email, especially, I, I would appreciate it. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Callers on the line, this is your last opportunity. If you wish to speak on agenda item number 12, please press star three to raise your hand. Okay, caller with phone number ending in five, eight. 
Please press star six to unmute yourself and state your name if you wish. Good morning. My name is Leah Meisenheimer. I am the current president of the board of directors for the Vallejo Historical Naval Museum. As a board member, I can speak to the valuable um, the value of our small collection of historical records. We appreciate the numerous volunteers that work tirelessly to document, categorize, and then make these records accessible for the public. So the thought of the elimination of the Solano County Historical Records Commission is concerning, as well as the lack of attention that they have been receiving. The records are part of our heritage and the governmental development. At the museum, I know that many historians and authors have benefited from the retention of records and the people who keep them to give them reference to where those records are. They have relied upon the county records as well. We know that staff comes and goes, and they may have a different perspective on what records need to be kept and what are valuable to our community. The commission is the voice of our community, and so they are the ones that have a different perspective through their love and dedication of the preservation of history, and so their oversight is necessary. The people who review these records through an unbiased and impartial eyes are necessary to ensure the preservation of those records. At the time when history when is, is being challenged and dismissed without community input, we need to do as much as we can to preserve and protect the records. And an oversight commission is needed to ensure that appropriate action is taken to make sure that important records are not further destroyed. This is my, re my understanding that the records for the um, internment camp for the Japanese Americans here in California and Solana County were destroyed prior to this commission being put into place. This is why the commission should be continued to put in place because they may have a different perspective on what records should be kept and what should be eliminated. Please do not eliminate this commission. We have seen through the loss of other documents through history that we have are irreplaceable and they are no longer part of our history. So please do not eliminate this commission and support them as much as possible so that we can keep Solano County's records alive and well. Thank you. Caller with phone number ending in five two. Please press star six to unmute yourself and state your name if you wish. Yes, good morning, uh, Chair Vasquez, Vice Chair Brown and respected Board of Supervisors and staff, thank you for your services to our community. My name is Raymond Cordemarsh, and during my life of service to this great city and county, I continue to learn the deepest importance of community collaboration to help bridge the gaps. Uh, each one of you clearly know this at the deepest levels in your services to, uh, in your lives and services to our community. Uh, for the past three decades, I've had, along with others, uh, uh, KDEX certification, and more importantly, during the past five years uh, to address the opioid crisis, uh, my role as a behavioral health integration specialist has been um, uh, instrumental. Uh, uh, that's, in fact, helped birth a Drug Safe Solano uh, as a result of uh, ADAB's initiatives and those that are passionate about uh, saving lives and serving our community. Uh, I do want to say um, my recommendation request here is uh, simply, again, my desire is simply to uh, consider uh, having an outside audit to determine really the needs of each item that's presented here, uh, frankly, on uh, item 12, the agenda. Um, I do want to say as a result of working uh, specifically in this field of creating access to baby health services. Uh, I've recently worked with Partnership Health Plan along with uh, your staff there, Dr. Pottinger and Emery here in Solano County, and we established um, some funding sources to create access to our services. I work with an organization called Bright Hot Health, and we provide medication assistance, substance use disorder, services, mental health services, and also eating disorders along with chronic pain management. But in fact, I have an office, I'm not there today, but directly across from you at 609 Jefferson Street here in the great city of Fairfield. Uh, 
again, that is to just continue to create opportunities uh, to allow persons, again, bridge the gap and to allow persons to access comprehensive evidence-based uh, treatment. Again, just uh, as a way of advocating for the ADAB and those that are on your agenda item to consider, uh, please consider maybe, again, maybe a restructuring or reconsideration of those particular items and maybe to bring those back at a future date. Again, I really want to thank each and every one of you for your time and services uh, to our community. So that would be the conclusion of my comments today. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry, I have no additional callers with their hands up. So we have no additional callers and I have no more cards in front of me. So we're gonna go ahead and take this back in the hands of the board. Board members, can, do we wanna go through each one of them individually? Just as they were presented to us? Can we put that back up, sure. Ann? I'm sorry. Okay. Jenrick, will you please put the slide show back up, please? Well, we're starting with page. Page six. Six. Thank you. Okay. Starting with the Nutri Airport Advisory Committee. Any questions or comments on that? We'll take one at a time, so we'll go ahead and vote on the ad hoc's recommendation whether to maintain or dissolve. So this one is maintained. Is there a motion to? So moved. Second. So we move the second. Got to clear. Thank you. So ordered by a vote of 5-0. And the next one is Parks and Rec, slide seven. Next slide, please. So I move that we maintain this particular uh, committee, Parks and Rec. Second. Any questions with it? No. It's been moved and second. Please vote. So ordered by a vote of five zero. Slide eight now. Next slide. Oh, seven, I'm sorry. Eight. I move that we do restructure and we combine the advisory council for the library as well as the major L um, oversight. Second. Second, any questions or comments on that one? If not, it's been moved and second, please vote. So ordered by vote of five zero. Next slide. Well, I, I definitely ha would like to converse, have a discussion. You have one? Okay. That. What's that? Oh, okay. I, I didn't know what they were leftovers from. Oh, no, all right. right. Aaron? Yeah. <laughs> well, Aaron had hers lit before mine. Yeah. So. <laughs> well, that's the way it shows up. It's first and you, Wanda. Okay. Thank right. you. Thank you, Chair. Um, so I just have to make an overall statement, and it's three words, and that is this is an incomplete work product. I don't see where the, there has been input by the commissions themselves, as well as input by the citizens about what to do next. And it's only evidenced by the fact that um, the ad hoc committee didn't even know that there was the commission for women and girls and there's a nonprofit 
for women and girls so that it is cost neutral to the county to support this commission. And one of my challenge, actually it's my biggest challenge about this, this whole process is we need community input to do the work that we're doing. We do not have all the answers, and I'm sorry staff, you have a lot of answers, but you don't have all of them. And the boots on the ground in our realm in terms of advising us, um, whether we direct them or they take it upon themselves to provide what it is they want is through public input. And by shutting down commissions and boards, it, in my mind, I, I can't support that at all. I think that if you're looking at, um, and first of all, I, I also don't think that your, whatever the recommendations were, don't really come fully supported with facts and figures and documentation that moves me to make any other decision other than to stay status quo. So I think if you want to enhance them, this is the time to do that. But I think eliminating them is not the, the path we should be going down. So I cannot support um, restructuring or doing anything like that for this particular commission and for any of the others that are left on the table. And I didn't say all that for that, but thank you. I just feel that, you know, we've heard from the community, we've heard from people who serve on these boards and commissions, and they provide a place for them to bring information to to, to those other members and also up to the county, as well as providing information for themselves and other citizens, particularly com, you know, commissions like this one that's in front of us, um, and certainly ADAB and you know, the historical commission. So yeah, I can't support any of these changes, frankly. So um, I will not be supporting them going forward for any of the commissions. Well, I'm, I'm not sure what you're then saying about the Women's and Girls Commission, for it to stay what it is right now. Not, yeah, exactly. Keep it the way it is. You're not, there isn't anything in here saying why it should become something else or why it should go somewhere else. I don't feel like you're providing, you and uh, Supervisor Brown have provided really any facts to, to, to make me vote or to actually spur me to support okay. a change. Wanda? Thank you. Uh, well, my concern is what I've heard this whole morning. It's an overarching theme, the lack of transparency and um, the lack of actually working with these different commissions and find out uh, if there's any needs or how it could be restructured. It just sounds like they had zero input uh, in this process. And I understand we're the policy makers, but even in that, we still have our constituents and our public. And so they should always have an opportunity to have their voice heard and to give comment and, and give it advice on certain things. I'm really concerned about all of them actually that's being uh, recommended. But right now, since we're voting on the uh, Commission of Women and Girls, it sounds like they have not been um, advised or had an opportunity to talk to find out if this is even feasible to even reconstruct their commission. They're doing excellent, great work in the community. And to, just to hear that they're taking on uh, challenges that uh, unfortunately was changed in, within our county. Uh, so just to know that they are doing all this great work. Uh, I too can't say that I can support this on any of the other commissions either. Um, they provide a, a great resource to our community. And I, I'm recommending that, you know, some of them may can be restructured, but I think this needs to go back. I think the ad hoc committee actually needs to meet with these different commissions, work with them, see what changes can be made to make them even more effective, more efficient, and uh, so that they can continue to do the work that they're doing and to pro provide that service that is so valuably needed in our community. And that is our public having an opportunity to participate in the democratic process. And this is their way to have a voice. And so right now what you're saying is I wanna strip their voice from them 
by dissolving their committees, not even just talking to them. They had to find out because they saw it posted. They didn't even get the courtesy of a call. So, you know, that, that's really my concern. Thank you. So the Women and Girls Commission has been around for, I'm going to say, four years, five years. The goal is we're going to set you free. I knew that you guys had a nonprofit. I did not know it was independent, and I would think it would be under your umbrella, but that's just my take on it. So that was my misunderstanding of, of what you had with the nonprofit status. So um, all I know is that you can continue working. No one's saying you can't continue to work. No one's saying you can't continue to do what you want to do. It's just that the board is saying, or at least I am anyway, I'm just saying you don't need to have the board support. You have been doing very well. You now can go and do what it is you want. You've gotten some grants based on the comment from the speaker. That's fantastic. That's what we want you to do. You can always come back and give us an update. That's not the issue. You don't need to have the board support. OK, you don't need to have my support anymore. You are launched, basically. You've done what I would like you to do, which is to be independent, do whatever investigation you want to do, and then let the board know. So that's my take on it. So I took it as a, the model we used for CASA when CASA was underneath the county and then it became independent. It's still part of the county system and we do get reports from them annually, but they were able to go after their own grants and do quite well. In fact, it's, it's, it's flourished uh, as an independent uh, nonprofit. Uh, again, having the county's blessing over it. But, so that was my thought of how it would look like. But uh, okay, Mitch, any questions? I don't have any particular questions, uh, uh, Mr. Chair, but just a, just a, a statement in that I also uh, uh, think of other agencies that have been stood up by the county um, and, are now, and have now moved beyond uh, uh, being under the county jurisdiction and are their own entity, and, and CASA is a great example. Um, <clears throat> but I feel that the work is vital, and I feel that, um, that if it's required, that, or it's, it's needed that the county still maintain this group for a period of time until such a, a, a time as they're ready to fold into a nonprofit, that that would make sense. Um, if they are, in fact, ready to transition, I don't know, having not spoken to them, if they're not ready to make that transition, then um, uh, maybe we should, we should uh, wait on this one um, and do exactly what it says, as, assign staff or have staff work with them to start moving that direction, if that's their desire. Um, my two cents. So does someone want to offer a motion? Yeah, I'm going to offer the motion to um, retain, maintain the Solano Commission for Women and Girls. Second. Yeah, so I, I, it was never intended to try to dissolve it. That's not it. it. Was to give them the flexibility. If they're better suited being under the county's umbrella, under the board's umbrella, for benefits of going after grants, then that's what should be part of it, of it. But also to allow them to transition, maybe not the commission itself, but a, a nonprofit of theirs, and it appears that that's happening, for them to then put on these programs or do reports or whatever it is. If they still need the, the, the board's underlying or um, over the top of them for uh, that support in order for them to, to be able to go after those things, I, I think that's what we should be doing. But we can bring that back and say, and kind of talk about how, what that should look like, as opposed to using the word restructure. However you want to do it moving forward, I want to maintain it today okay. um, in its current form, being supported by Solano County. It does have its own nonprofit. Um, but I mean, you know, it, it just goes back to the statement, the ad hoc committee did not even talk to the, at least, certainly with Solano Commission for Women and Girls. You would have known they would have, ha they had a nonprofit. You would have known a, a lot of that stuff. And that well, I made did not come up. And so, I mean, to me, that's, you know, work pro uh, incomplete work product. And I can't support that. Monica? Um, 
I would like a time limit, one year, six months, something that we that it, every, it must come back. What kind of restructuring? What is it that they need? <clears throat> Excuse me, so that this just doesn't go on and and we look at it ten years from now because we didn't get a chance to go back and look at it. We need some sort of a sunset, some sort of an ending date. That but, comes but you're back making to an assumption that they that there is a restructure in its future. That isn't necessarily the case. I mean, you'd have to have a board that would vote on that. So, by our bylaws, I mean, I've heard that term before, um, around policies and procedures is that these are reviewed once a year. And, um, you know, we all know how those years slip. Slip. But uh, I'd rather retain it in its current form. Mr. Am, Mr. Am, if we do, um Take a look at sort of how this goes forward, and and look at the relationship between the nonprofit and the and the county. We do need to look at some of the legal issues that are associated with that as well. So that that's something we part of that process. And the problem is, is that if it's if it's separate, it's separate. If it's not separate, then you're commingling a nonprofit and a county advisory body. And so that's where we need to make sure that there's clarity as to if it is a nonprofit and accepting grants. That's wonderful, and, and we want, as we've talked before about nonprofits, to go out and get as many grants as possible. But then that's separate and distinct from the role of this board as th this board meaning as the, advisory as advisory to you. And so that's that's why it's a, it's become a little murky. Um, again, there's just things that we need to make sure that there's clarity as to how those two separate and distinct one nonprofit separate on its own, and then one advisory to you how they interact. Well, I just want to add, I, I think waiting a full year, I mean, I like how it is, but at least take some time to meet with them and have this discussion instead of bringing it before us without done those additional steps. So well, I just think that you need I'm, time quite frankly, to work on it. Quite frankly, there's been some statements made that we didn't do good work. Well, we can't communicate that to you because we're an ad hoc committee and only two of us can speak to each other. So I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna comment on the work and the, and the stuff we did as an ad hoc committee. I'm speaking but, but not to your work, I didn't do my but work. making sure you get an opportunity to meet with the different commissions and have those conversations with them so that you can work through these, these things going forward as an ad hoc, that's my recommendation. Thank you. Mr. Chair, can I go ahead? Ask a quick question. This goes back to what you were saying, Bernadette. It is, um, so what it sounds like to me is that there needs to be, uh, a, a, the entity would need to be uh, bifurcated. So there needs to be the formation in this entity of a foundation that has its own board that governs the nonprofit. And then there needs to be the role for this group that would then uh, be advisory for our board. So there is no, uh, uh, while, while the separate board foundation, whatever you wanted to call it, for a nonprofit um, would have governance over grants, would have governance over funding, would have governance over those things. This board, and, and quite frankly, many of these boards, the role needs to be advisory to this board. And specific to questions that are, that, uh, or, or policies that are relative to this board and their actions. Uh, and again, would only be advisory. Am I correct in all that? Yes, yes, you're correct. So, so uh, let me go, we, we have a motion. It, does anybody want to change the motion or add a... Uh, Can I hear the motion again? The motion is to maintain the Solano Commission for Women and Girls. <clears throat> and if there's a desire to change whatever's happening with the commission itself, that there be communication with the commission for women and girls and a, um, you know, a full report on, you know, why it should be restructured and what that restructuring looks like. I don't see where that could happen here. So, so just so you know, the, um, the beginning of the Solano commission for women and girls, I, I brought that forward to the board. Um, the challenge was is we were, there was no funding, and yet we were tasked with uh, bringing forward a report on Solano County women and girls to the Board of Supervisors. We were able to go to each of the cities as well as seroptimus uh, groups around the county 
to receive uh, donations to put that report together because it's not a free, you know, it just doesn't come out of the sky. <laughs> so part of that was to create a nonprofit. So you have the commission and a nonprofit that helps support the cost of providing those reports, of doing whatever, you know, the, the honoring women every year. The, you heard Edie speak about the work that they do on a regular basis as well as some of the other work that goes on in terms of childcare and what have you. So they have work groups, they have, they're a busy commission, they're a working commission, they're very active. And um, I, I, didn't, I, I don't see any, I didn't see anything in the report as to indicate that there was even a conversation with a member of it other than maybe John's staff, but. I absolutely get that, but yeah. I just heard from council that the two commingled is an untenable situation. Well, so, so. But, but your county staff was involved in the creation of both of them, of both of the commission itself. And so there was a conversation initially around the commission and a nonprofit. And as far as I know, I'm looking at Edie or, what, excuse me. There you go, Jennifer, no. come on up. Oh. oh, don't answer the question. We they don't worry. Separate. They are separate, they're not commingled. So we have a motion. Is there a time limit? Is three months, four months for it to come back? A year. A year. I recommend a year as a part of my motion. To come back to the board. Yes, or no, for, for, for the county to look at it, to, to work with the commission, to, you know. To come back. To, to come board. back with a, with a full recommendation, not a one word restructure. That's the motion. We move the second. second. I'm okay with that. All right, move the second, please vote. So ordered by, so ordered by a vote of four one. Next slide. So the Alcohol and Drug Advisory Board is the next on the list. Okay, Aaron. Um, thank you, Chair. So the Alcohol and Drug Advisory Board, um, so in reading through the staff report, it isn't necessarily a dissolve, right? It's to fold it into the Mental Health Advisory Board or have the Mental Health Advisory Board. Emery, thank you. Um, yes, so I, I had um, updated you all on all the changes that have happened in our system and in the state um, requiring us to look at these things jointly uh, related to funding sources, related to duplication of care and services. Um, that's part of our mandate. Um, and so my recommendation was that we talk about these things in the same space because they're intertwined in so many ways and their, their funding is intertwined and the players are intertwined and the residential facilities and all of these um, things that you've heard. So that was my intent in trying to explain what's going on in our system. Yeah, um, again, this is another board I cannot support to dissolve. I think, um, first of all, this is a board that brings community members into the same space over a very particular issue, substance abuse and drug, drug abuse and overdoses and, and this terrible world that parents live in um, and people live in around um, illegal drugs. Earlier today, we had the correctional officers here, officers here with the, their, their puppy who, what does the puppy do? He looks for fentanyl in the jails. <laughs> I mean, we have drugs everywhere, illegal drugs that are accessible to all kinds of people. You can be under lock and key and still have access to it. The Alcohol and Drug Advisory Board has been a very active board. This is a place where the community can, can share resources, can um, advise uh, the county. It's very different from mental health I, you know, the, again, that statute, right? It's required. Um, and while I see where the state is cl closing them together, it doesn't necessarily mean that's best practices. I think it's more about streamlining than best practices. So um, I would offer the motion to maintain the Alcohol and Drug Advisory Board. 
Wanda. Yeah, well, I, I actually had wanted to ask some questions sure. in, in reference to the Mental Health Advisory Board. So would, I just wanted to make sure and understand that was the thought process is to combine them both and these members that are currently ser serving on the Alcohol and Drug Advisory Board, would they still be participating in this process or their service, or they're just going to be uh, no longer have a voice to represent those who have these life experiences and have opportunities to, as they've shared already today, actually share this information with the community as well. They're, they're in, a, in, a, in a face or they're an extension of the program by getting that information out into the community. I mean, we just listened to a mother say how difficult it was for her to um, find and locate the services. So my question is, is instead of a dissolvement, could it be reconstructed so that both groups are working together since the goal is to uh, streamline them together because of the intersectionality that they may have that overlap, even though not everyone on drugs have a mental health issue. <laughs> They're just medicating themselves because of life experiences. So I just wanted to know. Well, um, so Monica Brown is our chair for a mental health advisory board, and I think she might want to chime in on that. Okay. So listening to what folks had to say, that is what we talk about at the mental health advisory board. And the goal is to, just what we have here with the factors, is to blend them together. It's going to take a little bit of time, but if you don't, dissolve the ad hoc, say six months or whatever, while we integrate everybody, then we're not going to be able to integrate. So that's the intent. And we're following, if we want funding to continue, guys, from the state and the feds, we've got to integrate. Many of the things that I heard today is stuff that we talk about when we meet monthly. We talk about the suicide rates. We talk about you know, we, we have the mental health facility now. We talk about the fact that we don't have enough beds. We talk, everything that was talked there, we talk here. So um, that's my recommendation would be to dissolve with the understanding that we take into the factors and we blend together following what the state and national models are. If we want to continue to receive funding, that's where it's going. And the Narcan and everything, there's lots of money out there. I've gone to many different workshops to talk about all of that. And we can integrate it where we just do one, one group instead of two doing two separate things, even though it's the same thing. I don't know if that's articulating enough, but, but that's, that, that's, what I'm, that's where I'm going with it. And there's a board, um, an association that works in, with California counties to help with the boards. And they're about 50% of the counties have already merged their board and they're all moving that way because of Cal AIM. And that's one of the things I explained in the letter that I wrote. Cal AIM in two years is gonna require us to integrate care. Um, and so we're having to have those, you know, there's a lot of duplication of these conversations and what that causes is more confusion to communities because they don't know where to start to get help. You know, they don't know which line to call. There's so many doors. And so that's part of the confusion. I think you have partnership and their ODS waiver now that started in the last two years. You have Kaleem that's going to make us do this again in two years. So there's, there's a lot going on in behavioral that's changed in the last five years alone that's shifted a lot of the, the conversation. So it's not that the voice, obviously, SUD is one of our number one priorities in behavioral as much as homelessness, justice involvement. We've had 61 suicide deaths, 62 overdoses. It's right hand in hand. Like it's, you know, it's something we look at and talk about everywhere. So I just want to reiterate that that's important. So the dissolution of the board doesn't mean the problem's going to go away or the voices are not going to be heard. We just need to be more thoughtful and planful to where the, those things have an impact so that we can affect money and we can affect policy and we can affect support for the community. Well, what I did not hear was my part of my question was. These in those that are currently serving on the Alcohol and Drug Advisory Board, are they going to be integrated into this new uh, or into the Mental Health Advisory Board? Are, are, or are they just being dismissed? So, uh, because 
or new, are they gonna get seat? So all mental health advisory board members, currently there's an application process, and so we would have to look at the bylaws, make sure that we adhere to the requirements of the application. They would apply, there's certain, um, with the, this association that helps the counties, they have a process of how to do that thoughtfully and transparently so that we are not silencing any voices or, you know, the perception is that, you know, we still have space and room, obviously, for those places. So we'd have to think about the bylaws and the application process. And I would defer to council on that. Yeah. Thanks, Emery. And the only thing I would say on that is the composition of the Mental Health Advisory Board is a mandated commission. It is mandated by law that we have it that has certain um, representation, as she said. We can look at to where the membership is, if there's any vacancies right now. I'm sorry, I don't know that off the top of my head. No, we, we do. So, I mean, there's a, as, as she said, there's a process, there would be an encouragement that these are all public meetings and therefore notices can go out and as vacancies occur, they can be encouraged to apply. But again, that composition and therefore those positions are specific for certain categories. There must be one from the, from the Board of Supervisors. There must be, you know, a family member. There's, so there's different categories. So it would be depending on the vacancy as to whether or not a member who's currently on ADAB would then qualify for one of those slots. Okay, so there's no guarantee that they actually have an opportunity to be on this particular board. And, you know, I've But again, I just want to reiterate, they're notice public meetings. These are required under the Brown Act to be available. So uh, just because somebody's not on the committee or commission or board, whatever, at that time doesn't mean that their voice is not encouraged and or available to come to the meeting. Well, that, that's different. You're, you're saying they can just come and give comment. We're talking about someone and individuals who have taken time to dedicate themselves to do this work uh, because they're passionate about it they care about it and they want to make sure that the community knows and that they get an opportunity to work with the county. I've, I find that to be disheartening, uh, to say the least. And their voices will be silenced because they're not guaranteed on the board. It'd be different if you was going to say we're going to merge the two, uh, depart the two boards together to create this one board. And then I know they had a voice and then we could say, you know, in the next six months or so, you know, get everything in order first and then transition them in instead of just dissolving them. I've seen this happen when I was a council member. We dissolved a committee. Those individuals never came back and they just felt like, well, you, do, you have crushed my voice and now I don't even care to come back to participate and we lost valuable com uh, community members' voices in that process. And so I've already been through this before, and so that's why I cannot support if you're not going to make sure that they're a part of this process. And additionally, they should have been uh, notified and advised that this was gonna take place. There's one thing the county is gonna to have to really start thinking about and doing is being more transparent and definitely working closer and more with the community. And I think that's a disservice that we're, that we're providing by not doing, taking those two valuable steps. Because at the end of the day, every, these individuals that sit here and volunteer, they also vote us in office to look out for them, to make sure they have a voice and that we're speaking out for them. And so unless this is gonna be reconstruct, reconstructed where both groups come together, then I can't support it. I, I th let me call on Supervisor Mashburn. He's patiently waiting here. Thank you. I Thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate that. So a couple questions uh, uh, that are technical. First to counsel. Um, with regard to a proposed restructuring of this, while the state law does mandate a specific number of individuals who have a specific role on the board for mental health, um, at the point two years from now when the consolidation is required to take place, might that change? You're asking me to prognosticate as to what this no, is. No, but well, it, well I, I, it's kind of a rhetorical question right. in that it might change. But even if it didn't change, is it within the authority of this board to 
meet the statutory requirements with regard to appointments, but to go beyond that and add additional appointments, which I believe is acceptable, right? We can always go above and beyond the law. We just have to comply with the law. We, we can go beyond the law. Um, I would readily, readily say that I would need to look at that. I have not looked at it at the actual composition and what's included. My guess is probably, um, <clears throat> but I would just need to look at that. With that, um, my question for, for our uh, staff would be um, on the mental health board right now, um, there are individuals with lived experience. Yes. And I know for a fact that on the Alcohol and Drug Advisory Board, there are individuals with lived experience. I would, if there is the, the potential for a merger of those two into the future, I would want to assure that whether statu statutorily mandated or not by the state of California, um, that we include those individuals who have lived experience. Uh, on that. Um, um, one of the things that I uh, uh, have been trying to look at as, uh, as we work through the, all of these various committees is the role of the actual committee itself. So we heard a lot of the very emotional testimony today from the public about each one of these topics. Um, and on the Al Drug and Alcohol Advisory Board, um, we heard a lot about um, some of the stuff that the board has done in the community. Now, my question is, is and this is not to denigrate the board at all, uh, uh, because I appreciate volunteerism and I appreciate that they have a voice and they help us with advise, advice to this group, to the board itself. But the people who sit on that board, did they do that? Or did they direct staff and staff, county staff, supervised by county employees, did they go out and perform those functions? Did they put forth that effort? And was that done just at the behest of that board? The reason I ask that is that each one of these, by my understanding, is supposed to be an advisory body to, the to board. this board. And this board, based on our policies, directs the county administrator to direct staff to perform a function. So if we are going to utilize these, these boards or these various committees as advisory bodies, then I would like to make sure that we assure going forward that they are just that and that we don't have specific direction going out to staff and that we have reports and requests coming back to this board for allocation of resources, for the commitment of dollars, for all of those things that the advisory boards are supposed to be doing and giving to us. And the other piece that I would like to request is that we get regular updates on that. There are meetings going on all the time, and, I, and I'll use the Ag uh, uh, Commission as an example, where our staff is, is uh, 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 Ag Commissioner King, reports out to the commission on the actions of the board. That's kind of backwards. That's kind of like the tail wagging the dog, right? They're supposed to be an advisory commission to this board. And so they should be meeting and hearing from us what we need. And if we don't need anything, there's not really a reason for them to have a meeting at that moment, right? There are entities that exist within the county that are very, very relevant and timely with regard to some of these issues. Um, and, and again, uh, uh, what are we on right now? We're on the Alcohol and Drug Advisory Board. We, <laughs> I lose track because we've been talking about so many. We have staff who are, are, are relevant there. We have associations who are relevant there. And we have nonprofit providers who are relevant there right now. I'm not saying that the folks that sit on that board aren't relevant and they aren't necessarily experts on that topic. But we do have resources of the board that we can access on a regular basis who do come here to make reports to us, who do, uh, we do ask questions of with regard to homelessness and mental health and drug and alcohol addiction. So do we absolutely need uh, uh, a, a board, have, need bureaucracy, need more government uh, uh, in order to fulfill our function? 
I don't know uh, that we do or we do not. I know that I'm hearing from staff at some point we need to, to combine these two committees. Um, or the efforts. With, with, and, and their efforts. And uh, um, I would ask my last question of council, is it necessary to dissolve this committee to make that, that, that uh, uh, combination happen? And it's not necessary to dissolve it. It would be necessary to provide staff or direction to the both bodies as to their role and function. Um, so I just do want to point out that somebody did send me the code section, and so I do have it that you do have the ability. Um, currently, the um, mental health services has a mental health board consisting of 10 to 15 members, but the law specifically says that you're not limited to that 15. You can go above. So go back to your original question. So, so we could. You could go. We could actually. You could. We, there's no expand, mandate that says yeah, we cannot. Right. You could expand that. Um, going back to your original question, which started this, is that we just need clarity. What, what do you want these respective advisory bodies to do? If if your staff is saying it's going to be a, you know, a unified behavioral health division, and they're looking at the community health, mental health board to be that behavioral health board, then what role does the ADAB function? And so that's the, st that's the, the clarification. We just need, what do you want this advisory body if the one is going to be unified, what is the other one doing? If you want them unified, how big do you want that body to be? And then, and then go from there. So I guess what I would say is that um, my motion would be to direct staff to our staff to, my motion would be that we table this for a period of time and that we uh, direct staff uh, in, a, in a very timely fashion to come back to us with a um, industry standard, with you, if you will, a, a recommendation based on uh, best practice for the um, commingling, the, the, the merger of the two organizations and what that structure should be based on what the state's requirement is for uh, that group to be in 2024. That makes sense? Yes. Kind of. I second that because I do understand it. Okay. So <laughs> my question is, we're not going to merge the board. We're just simply going to look at a larger board that would... Would take over the function of Some of the functions. Committee. So that is, in the community, they go to one spot. That doesn't mean that those board members actually go on that board immediately because you have to open that process up to the community to see who wants to volunteer in those new positions. Am I right. correct in that? And they also have to be interviewed. Yes. So if you're asking for the, the whole slate to move over. Well, no, you're asking to do that. No, I'm not. Well, no, you're talking about dissolving it and that the Mental Health Advisory Board would pick it up is what, is what, is what you've recommended. Yes. You and Supervisor Brown have recommended that without any conversation or any documentation around how that could even happen, how it would operate. And, you know, I mean, it's, again, it goes back to incomplete work product. Um, and I appreciate the direction, but I think that um, I, I would want to know, well, I, I want to know so much about this. <laughs> what are the pros and the cons? What gets lost in the process? If they have to apply to be members of the, man, of the Mental Health Advisory Board, do they have to fit in a specific category? What are those extra categories? Well, that was, that are was, they going to be specific? We just, we just had that discussion. No, I know. But so that. what do those categories look like? If you're expanding it, do we require other types of um, uh, relationships, if you will, in those categories, or are they just generally the alcohol ADAB people that are serving on the mental health advisory board? Is that how that looks? Which is why I ask for a study of the best practices that are statewide and are also going to be state mandated according to our staff. In I think 2024. that would give us more answers than just than this. This report. that was my ask, and that was Monica's second. Oh, that's a if, well, if I could I'm just done calling on the supervisors, we can vote on it. Aaron, did you want to speak again? Wanda? Mitch turned his off. So does somebody want to take a stab at it? But there was a motion and a second. Yeah, I just. I, I have a motion to, to maintain it. So, no. This is a substitute motion. Yeah, substitute motion, yes.
to maintain it for a period of time, a, a short period of time, while staff has the ability to make the review necessary in order to accomplish what's required by the state law that we uh, merge these two at some point and to give us an appropriate structure for that. It, it does, it, that doesn't solve the issue of confusion with where folks go. If it was, if I was to make the motion, it would be to dissolve this and give direction to expand the mental health board, given those categories that we would think would help with the, the, doing the, the stuff that the advisory board was doing. And again, it's advisory. It's not supposed to give direction or tell staff what to do. It's supposed to send their, their recommendations to the board, and then we hear them. I think Maybe. that's clever, Chair. What's that? We'll dissolve it and then wait for a report later. Yeah. I mean, we've... <laughs> it is clever. Thank you. <laughs> I can't support that cleverness. <laughs> well, that would be my motion, so... Well, why can't they stay uh, uh, an advisory board while the staff is developing it? So, uh, advisory to who and to when? When was the last time you got anything from the advisory board? Well, that's because oh. we don't request for the advisory don't board to come. We, we, I have, we well, received I a report out. Ramon, when was the last time you were here reporting out on fentanyl and trank and all that? April 2022. You know, oh, wait a minute. This is, okay. This is back this is at the board. Yeah. That's what, so that's what I was referencing. You know, let's let them stay in the, where they are currently. The Alcohol Drug Advisory Board, instead of just dissolving it, gives staff an opportunity to, as uh, Supervisor Mashburn has said too, and uh, he agreed with me as well, that we should give the staff an opportunity to look at how to bring them together and what would that look like and where's the best practices for that. So I am not comfortable with dissolving them at all. I think we need to give staff time to work on developing what the new uh, advisory board would look like uh, with the mental health in combination and combining their forces with alcohol and drug, the advisory board, and then at least give them an opportunity to make sure that they can be on this board. All right, let me ask the county council, where are we at? We have the, the first motion was not to dissolve. The second motion is the substitute motion. Is the substitute, substitute motion is is to um, temporarily leave this uh, board with its function while staff does the study with yeah. speed, bring it back to this board uh, um, so that we can. Uh, then initiate. Wrote it down. You wrote it down. Okay, then, so we can then initiate yeah. the merger. What, what you said was to temporarily maintain it as is, but direct staff on industry standards for the best practice for commingling the two based on state requirements for that group as it w will be in 2024. Correct, because it's inevitable. It's going to happen one way or the other. This, this, this group is going to be dissolved at some point. It is going to have to happen to be in compliance with state law. So. Uh, um, all we're doing is delaying the inevitable very shortly. Well, I just want to add. Well, wait, wait, not, wait, let me. Real quick, procedurally, I just think I do think you had a second on that one with, yes, with Supervisor Brown. So that is the motion on the table, the on the table. Even though that there was it was a substitute motion, the first motion didn't get a second. Therefore, that is the motion okay. on the table. No, I think the first motion well, did. If, if point of order. Even if it did. First, yes. Substitute yeah. motion. Yeah. Yeah, substitute Always. motion. Yeah. All right, there's I'm really confused. first and a second on the, on the substitute motion. Right. Please vote. We didn't add a time. So how long? So ordered by a vote of 5-0. Okay. I'm hoping this time will not be that. I know. Next slide. Next slide. Okay, so the next one is the Solano Partnership Against Violence. All right, any? 
I, I move the uh, ad hoc committee recommendation to dissolve. The factors are stated. It no longer reflects the state's penal code. Does not mean that when we finish everything happening with the Solano Family Justice Center, something new might morph. But for right now, it doesn't meet the qualifications. Any discussion on that? I have a question. Go ahead, Wanda. So my question, when we dissolve this, and I thought I heard staff indicate that they do not have, or please help me understand, do you have the capability to absorb uh, this domestic violence prevention? Uh, how are you going to help our, our um, individuals that are experiencing domestic violence? Because I went to the website, and I couldn't find anything on there for you to get help with domestic violence. So, so I need to understand. Mm -hmm. So SPAV is separate from the Family Justice Center. Um, so the Family Justice Center is active and going. That would be the website that you would want to go to to get help. And that is active and going. We're um, in the process of finishing up the strategic planning um, that happened back in March. And that report will be coming before your board. And that will have some recommendations as well as groups um, that will and work groups coming out of that. Um, but SPAV is separate from that. So, so this is this is a com advisory committee yeah. where Family Justice Center is a, and the Office of Family Violence Prevention is an organization and a a, um, it runs a program. De a department within the county. So th they're, they're okay. completely separate. So who would be then advising on uh, domestic violence? Are we going to have people with, that have lived experience? How is this going to, to work? So there's a couple of things that are in, in process. Um, one of the recommendations that you'll be hearing about when the strategic planning process comes about um, standard practice, it's called Voices, and it's all people with lived experiences. They recommend a Voices Committee, um, and that is one of the recommendations that will be coming before the board. So this will be replaced so, with the Voices Committee? Well, so SPAV won't necessarily be replaced with the Voices Committee, and, and I want to be clear that I'm not sure that I'd have to go look. There's nobody with lived experience designated on SPAV. So that's not necessarily what SPAV does. Um, if you look at what their activities are, they bring together a collaborative group. Um, and that is very similar to what um, the Family Justice Center does. But SPAV just provides um, a forum for people to talk about um, what they're doing. When you say people, are these just community, community members yep, community, and community NGOs? Community organizations. Nonprofits, non the CBOs, mm -hmm. okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Sometimes they're. I don't think they're part of the group, but they do come talk. Yep. And in the past, what have they advised the, this? Because I'm new to the board. Okay. So I haven't been here forever. So I want to know what have they? Oh, I, well, I didn't, no pun intended. Uh, I I'm just trying to figure out. Well, what have they advised, or what? how they've been calendared to advise in the past. To, to my knowledge, in the past two year, three years, they have not. Do you know why? I, I do not. So th there's what? nobody from SPAV here. I, I'm just a, the staff member who helps take notes and keeps things going. <laughs> well, I just got to look to, to the ad hoc committee to give more content of why um, the recommendation is to dissolve uh, the committee if we don't have anything in place for them to continue to advise this board. So I, I just want more clarity if, if you can provide that. Well, it's a huge organization. It's staff, our county staff people and nonprofits talking about the issues. I don't recall many opportunities where they took to come and tell us what to do or advise us on programs and stuff like that. It, it, it probably was a great idea in 95 and, and then in 99, but these, 
again, we're looking at all these and looking at their efforts early on was to help us recognize that domestic violence was an issue. But we, as a county, we've grown and we're providing the services. You know, the Fa Family Justice Center, we were gonna redo that. It's gonna provide more and more services. There's less reason for people to be concerned about the services because they are being provided. So I think SPAB is, is well past its time. If you, if you go back to the, to the formation of it, why it was done, and you look at where we're at today, it's a world of difference. And if I can add on to that, I was the um, analyst assigned to SPAV prior to Ms. Lukens, and the only time that they came to the board was for their work plan in the previous five years before that. Um, and as she stated, it's typically a round table discussion. They'll have presenters come in to discuss things of interest to the group. It hasn't been called upon in, in the past few years to provide any advice to the board. And I think part of that is because um, SPAV actually predated the formation of the Family Justice Center. Oh, yeah. So there's been sort of this evolution, and now we're obviously we're going through another evolution with, I think, even more expanded services to the Family Justice Center, which is a reason why this is kind of uh, maybe at the point where we, we move on. Yes. Make a comment. So should we vote to dissolve this commission or any other commission? Um, I would request that a very nice, gentle, loving letter goes out to our volunteers that serve, that take their time to serve on these commissions, to share gently, nicely, kindly that um, uh, the reason why that, that their commission that they you know put, pour their heart into um, is being dissolved and that we with utmost respect, thank them for their many, many years of, and hours and time of service. Um, I just wanna make sure that that happens. I've seen some communication come out from our county to folks and it's not always the most pleasant. So that is my request. All right, any other comments? Okay. Who made the motion? We have, a motion from, we have a motion from Supervisor Mashburn, seconded by Supervisor Brown, to dissolve. I thought you were first. No, you no, first. No, first, okay. Yep. Okay, it's been moved and second. Please vote. Next slide, please. So ordered by a vote of five zero. We have the Agricultural Advisory Committee. Okay, any comments, questions, Wanda? <laughs> well, you know where I stand already because I've made it very clear that I'm not in favor of dissolving the Agricultural Advisory Committee. Uh, this particular committee, as we heard today from the testimonies, is truly significant for our, our, our county because our county is really unique because we do have a farming uh, community. They create $1.6 billion uh, in our economy, and this gives them an opportunity to come to this board if we would request them and give them that opportunity uh, to actually come and provide the necessary feedback that we need, we, I, and, and I'm not, I can't speak for everyone on this board, I'm gonna speak for myself. I'm currently not farming. And I get to go into the grocery store and buy my groceries. And so I have to thank a farmer every single day because I know they're doing the work. But most importantly, we need them to be able to provide the information we need. As a supervisor, I received a call because there was a, a, a disagreement between two uh, farmers, well, a farmer and an organization, over bumblebees. Now, granted, I know a lot of you are like, well, how can you have an argument over bumblebee bumblebees? Well, bumblebees uh, actually release, it, they call it bumble, bumblebee poop, but it's really like pollen and different things that they release. It's like a yellow substance, 
and it blows down wind. Well, this particular farmer had 400 beehives on a small acreage of land. I had to call, um, oh my God. Ed, Ed yes. <laughs> I, I'm looking at him like, what's his name? I'm sorry, Ed, my, my apologies. I had to call Mr. King for help. And, and so I asked him, well, where's the Agricultural Advisory Committee? And unfortunately, they were advised to not meet and then sent a letter indicating because they weren't meeting, they're going to no longer be, be a commission, a committee. And that's to me, it's like an oxymoron. It's like you can't tell somebody don't meet and then tell them because you're not meeting, I'm going to dissolve your committee. But I think it's a, a disservice to this county. It sends a very bad message to the agricultural community. This is their opportunity to have a voice, to share some advice with us because we deal with the unincorporated area that's pre predominantly ag. And I believe instead of dissolving this, it should be restructured. Uh, they have found that they could actually provide even more input to share as advice to this committee, and especially I want to see them intact as we are building out Sassoon Valley and all the other different things that are happening in ag. They should have been involved and have an opportunity to come advise our BOS when Flannery was buying up all the land. What would you have done? What could they have said to you? The point is they could have came earlier to advise they weren't given the opportunity to share that information when it first started happening with them. Well, we and how they've been, been uh, pretty much bullied into giving up their land, uh, some of them. So I think it's a disservice with this, for this board not to keep the Agriculture Advisory Committee. And I, I'm saying that I'd like to request that it be restructured and that we work with them to build the new structure and then also making sure the board is actually sending them the information so that we can get their advice on issues that do come up to us that we need their input on. Thank you. Mitch. Okay, uh, a couple of things. Um, <clears throat> first, as the individual who was at the meeting last night with the Farm Bureau, <clears throat> where this came up, and I declined to speak because I knew I was going to be here today hearing this item, and I didn't want to have to recuse myself. Uh, you heard me speak earlier about the fact that, uh, uh, well, first, let me just say that um, agriculture does matter to me. I think agriculture matters to every single member of this board, and it matters to all the citizens of our county for the reasons that Mr. Anderson stated, aside from just the economic piece. Uh, it's also part of our history here, a deep part of our history. Um, and <clears throat> I want to make it clear that I fully support agriculture. But again, I don't necessarily always support bureaucracy or government just for the sake of government. Um, you heard me speak earlier about the fact that uh, um, we haven't, as a board that I know of, seen a report out from this particular group in, since I've been here that I know of. Um, the, the board itself, uh, when we talk about function in the community that has the ability to advise this board, um, the Farm Bureau that we just met with last night is a more vast representation of agriculture today in Solano County. Its membership, I believe, is at 300 individuals or close to that. Am I right, Mr. Anderson? Farm Bureau, about 300 folks. I, I, I can't give you an exact number. I think there is a range of actual farm bureau members, but I believe there's more membership, higher membership than that because we have to ask the Farm Bureau members. All right. I'm a Farm Bureau member, I'm not on that board. Well, I got you. So thank you, though, for the input. So uh, it is also more representative of the farm industry. So when we talk about the fact that, that the uh, agriculture in Solano County is a billion dollar uh, uh, business, 
Um, there are a large part of that billion dollars, our, our crop value was $440 million. A large portion of that is also the industry that supports it. And that industry is growing and it's growing rapidly and it's advancing with technology and all these other things. So an advisory group that is not representative of all that is not necessarily giving us the best advice that we could have as a board. When we talk about the Vintners Association out in Susun Valley, great resource, very specific, has the ability to speak to those specific agricultural issues. We talk about the Fruit Growers Association in Susun Valley. They also have the ability to speak to those specific issues that are in agriculture right now. This committee, I would, I would ask, what have they considered lately? What has this board asked of them? I know that you have asked specifically about bees. I can say that I have asked very specific questions about agriculture of the groups that I just spoke of. When we did uh, our subcommittee on agriculture, we reached out to all those groups, including the, the commission, um, but the input was, I would say, more, more vital and more thorough from those specific groups that I spoke of, the Farm Bureau, the Vintners Association, the Fruit Growers Association, the Cattlemen's Association. I guess what I'm getting to is that while this does provide a voice, all of those other organizations do too and it's a broader voice, it is a more uh, 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 current voice, I think, and it has uh, uh, more direct relevance to this board at this time. I, I have to agree that these other, other organizations are vital, but as it is written in this particular uh, advisory committee, Every industry that you just mentioned, they all are represented here. And actually, the person that I that is uh, actually appointed from my district serves on the Vintners and, and Fruit Growers Association. So all those different organizations that you've just mentioned are actually represented here. And then they could use this group to be able to bring that advisory if we give them the opportunity to come and ask and request. But if we aren't requesting and we're telling them don't meet and then tell them because you're not meeting, we're going to dissolve your committee, it's not fair and we're stifling voices. And I'd not, I support ag 100%. Um, I, I had to learn about ag. No, 